Hey everybody in Serial Killer Country, my name is Brittany Ransom. And my name is Brian Joyner. And this is When Killers Get Caught, a podcast devoted to deep dives into the lives and psyches of the killers we love to learn about. Each week, Brian and I will find a true crime story that resonated with us, and then I'll discuss one well-known or lesser-known killer and go deep into their childhood, lives, methodology, and most importantly, how they got caught. And then we'll get a little spooky and learn something about the cryptids or the supernatural. But to start us today, Brian has an update on one of his earlier stories. And this is, yes, oh my God, from episode two. Episode two? Wow. Episode two. That was the hands that... <laughs> resist him. The hands that resist them. Yes. Uh, so I think this past week uh, we got an email from a viewer. Um, we want to say their name? or uh, I don't know if they... I'm, I don't it's know like if a they, first name. Yeah, uh, it's Michaela. All right. Um, hi, Michaela. Hi. Um, so they emailed us and told us that there was a new painting out by uh, William Stoneham. Right. Uh, that came out in 2021. Um, and it's called What Remains. Okay, um, I got to Google this now. Here, I got already got it pulled up for you and everything so you can Ooh. look at it. Right. I remember in Michaela's email, she said something about the doorway just looking ancient now. So just, it looks like there's the the doll legs at the top. This just looks like a demon stairwell. You're right? It looks so freaky. This doesn't look like anything related to... Like, the boy's gone. All that's left are his shoes. The, that might be his head on the ground. The doll's legs the are just The doll's hang- legs are dangling. There's oh. a battery on the ground. Yo. <laughs> this is brutal, fam. It's a cool picture. I mean, Stoneham is a very good painter in general. Oh, yes, definitely. But I just, like, I saw the, the, the picture, I mean, the painting, and I was like, oh, I got to talk about this. That's amazing <laughs> that, like, we talked about that, what, like, January 14th? Yeah, I believe so, And yeah. now, like, eight, seven-ish, eight-ish months later? Look, people, when they start listening to us, they, they listen from the first episode. I know, I, but here's the thing, okay, so anyone listening now, I'm kind of embarrassed about the first Just a little episodes. bit, yeah. I remember the first time we finished, I was just like, <sighs> we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I was so scared. I think I was just speaking a mile a minute, that's why I like... Yeah, once you get into like our, what, our teens or stuff like that, and... I feel like by March we had a good groove. Yeah, um, whenever we got this new setup, and then we got our, yeah, we, once we got our groove going, and then we got... Well, one of our reviews says that by like three or four, mm-hmm. we're doing a considerable battle job. The problem was there were a couple of technical snafus Yes. in the early, like the aughts. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, people complained about like the volumes not being right, and uh, I was too loud. I was too quiet sometimes. I was too quiet. Well, you're always <laughs> I'm quiet. always quiet. So. Who you are. <laughs> but yeah, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's not even our true crime news for the week. No, we got loads all. of other stories. But before we go there, just covering a little bit of our uh, business bases. Our Patreon is live, and thank you so much to our three patrons now. Yes. Uh, we have four tiers that range from $5 a month up to $50, and you can get everything from the uh, wonderful Conspiracy Crypt episode, which is a 30-minute episode of us discussing random conspiracy theories that we like we don't like who knows Mm -hmm. and it goes all the way up to getting to have a conversation with brian and i at the end of the month yes Uh, you can sign up for that at patreon.com slash when killers get caught and you may also check out our merch on when killers get caught.com click on the store there are stickers hats crop tops regular t-shirts we carry things up to a 5x because i love inclusivity So if you want to support us, that is the easiest way. Oh, and we do have a patron goal, which is that if we get 500 patrons, I'm going to say before the end of the year, I will allow (laughs) Brian to take me to the Lizzie Borden house and sleep in the most haunted room and participate in a ghost story. We'll even live stream it for you on TikTok. It'll be, I swear, it'll be great. You guys check it out. Uh, just 500 that's all we need. i'm so not looking forward to that <laughs> i i doubt it's gonna happen but you know hey <laughs> we'll see we'll see but this week in true crime i want to let you all know about a story that has been unfolding over the last few I, well okay so the post popped up on facebook august 12th and at 8.30 p.m., and it says archived content, there's an incredible crime story unfolding now in South City. Eight days ago, a woman named Elizabeth Cook attempted to steal a man's car in Marine Villa. He caught her in the act. She ran away and she dropped her cell phone. 
So when the police were called, he tried to give her phone to the cops to like help find her. Right. But the cops were like, no, 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 we don't need it. Well, I don't want it. It's her phone. Right. Well, the man goes in and takes over her Facebook account, begins posting hundreds of her text messages, emails, photos, and they all have detailed, incriminating criminal evidence. That the cops didn't want? Yes. Planning and executing dozens of thefts around South City and St. Louis. Um, oh, wait, wait. So you don't even lock your phone? Apparently she didn't. Um, some of the property has been recovered thanks to these posts. Oh, my God. Um, not to mention, um, they contacted, like, he used the phone numbers to mm. contact some of her accomplices oh. um, who are like, what? what are you talking about? We don't know who this is. No, he, looked up, messages, boy. he looked up her Google history, and it had things like how to hotwire this brand name car. Oh, my God. Or, what is the easiest car to steal? Wow. <laughs> then he finds something worse. Ooh. She made friends with a 62-year-old ex-con last December. His name was Bobby Phillips. And so um, apparently he really, really liked her, Bobby. And three days later, he wrote a will leaving everything to her. Two more days later, he's dead. Uh And so, uh, and mind you, he does have a drug overdose at her house. Uh Um. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence right now that she might have deliberately spiked some of his drinks. Um, There's a screenshot on her phone of like his will and their stuff crossed out. It has her address on it. Um, People went to it. It's nobody's there now. It was like uh, the address was like uh, 5155 Kensington Avenue. I don't know where that is. I'm like, when I saw Kensington, I was like Philadelphia, but apparently there's a lot of Kensingtons in the world. Yeah. 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 Um, And so the person who wrote this was like, Oh crap. I was there at one point. Um, I'm, this guy was going to buy that house, but somebody else, like the old guy, bid yeah. on it and beat him. And they're like, holy crap, like this is the house that. So he posted pictures of when he walked through that property, that's... like when he was going to buy it. I'm like, what a small world. That's wild. But um, yeah, her 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 in a wheel thing. That sounds a little familiar. Right. It sounds just like um that doctor we talked about. <laughs> Shipman. Yes. <sighs> Well, here's the best part, right? So I joined these Facebook groups. There's one called the Elizabeth Cook Corkboard because Facebook has taken down her official account. Mm. So people have screenshot. This is 33,000 members. Oh, damn. And them, and it has a picture of uh, the guy from uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia pointing to the corkboard. Oh, yeah. Um, and they're like trying to connect the dots to all these crimes that she did. And then I joined another group that was Elizabeth Cork Crimes STL Corkboard. And it says this group is dedicated to solving the crimes and helping the victims as opposed to just gawking at the marvel that is, this madness offers. Yeah. If you have any information that may be helpful, feel free to reach out to admin and moderators. So they have like pictures of people that are missing or people who she's dealt with. This is just so interesting. It's just, that just sounds wild. God. Like, unlike the situation with Elisa Lamb, yeah. the netizens are, like, solving crimes Bro. in St. Louis. Oh so, God. good. All right, St. Louis. <laughs> Y'all are class. doing it. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great. But, yeah, I was like, wow, this is exciting. No, that's cool. They're, yeah, they're helping solve crimes. Yeah, great. Yeah. Oh, goodness. With the phone that the cops didn't want. Yeah. I guess there would have been, like, a legal situation with them having to, like, get the rights to, like, unlock her phone legally I and guess. warrants and stuff. Well, but it listen, wasn't locked. You we don't need it. no warrants up in here. No. If I find a phone and someone, like, stole my car and they left their phone, I'm taking that. That's what he did. That's he was mine. like, hey, you want this phone? And the St. Louis police were like, ah, we'll find her. Okay. I don't think they found her, but what they are finding is where she like stuff she sold and where she oh sold God. it to so and pawn shops she gave it to. So she's still out there. I think she might running be running around. Listen, Elizabeth Cook, if you're listening, your days are numbered. Oh the God. citizens of St. Louis are gonna find you. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> listen, we're like hours away. It's all good. Oh goodness. But what is your story, Brian? Okay. My story is a little bit of a doozy. Okay. <laughs> 
So this takes place this past week. Oh, as, like as soon as you said August twelfth, I was like, "You're not doing the same story as I am, are you?" <laughs> yeah, we come, we've come across that before. I know, um, but no, this one happened on August eleventh. Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure you've seen it. It's about my hometown. Uh, oh, like a sir. I was gonna do a TikTok about this. Uh, I'm so glad you did. I, mean, <laughs> I really, I have his picture in my phone. I mean, you might as well now. So you got it. <laughs> I'm I'll do it after it this goes live. I'll do this after this post. Oh my god! But yeah, okay. So, 32 year old man. Um, his name. Goodness. Got chunky face and he's pretty bald. <laughs> yeah, there you That's go. His, him. his name is Donald Meshi Jr. He's 32 years old. He is from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um. Funny story. The only reason why I wanted to cover this is because he went to the same middle school as I went to, and actually, at the same time, or is he like way? No, at the same time. <gasps> yeah. Oh, he looks mad old. Yeah. No, he's thirty two. I'm thirty three. He looks like he's in his forties. <laughs> See that life of crime? It just it just make it ages you. He has a he had a rough life. Racism um, and or uh, just being a criminal seems to age you dramatically. Yeah. So uh, my cousins know him. Um, I did think you talk my, to your family? I did not. Oh, I should have done it. I should have done it. But this, this made, no, that would have made it too long. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, uh, my cousin knows him. I think my brother knows him. My sister probably, too. I'm pretty sure I walked across him. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people in my family know him. Anyway, so this happened on Wednesday. Actually, no, not Wednesday. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay, so what happens is... Um, one of his relatives comes over to his house, right? Um, it's a woman, and she sees this head on a plate in no his way. fridge. It's sitting on a plate in his fridge. So she, you know, she rushes out of the house. She calls nine one one. She's like, "There is a head in my relative's fridge, and it looks like another one of my relatives." So, oh no! Cops this come over. So redneck. <laughs> So cops come over, they check, uh, they, you know, they question him, and he's like, "Yeah." So he pulls out the head, and so he tells them this story. Uh huh. Um, that one uh, at night he he goes into his father's room, mm -hmm. and he sees what he thinks to be a cadaver doll laying in his father's bed, and it sounds like his father. So he then proceeds to um. To stab said cadaver doll um, a few times for, uh, it says two to three minutes. He stabbed it Ooh. with a eight to nine inch kitchen knife. Okay. Um, and then he then proceeds to dismember this cadaver doll. And he puts the body parts into bags. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he put them in his garage or his basement. Um, Except for the head. No, he put them in the basement. No, he put them all in the basement. Everything in the basement. Hold on. I'm Sorry. Gonna, hold He's on. reacting to the way that I'm staring at him right now. Hold on. Hold on. So the day after he does this and dismembers the body mm -hmm. and puts all the body parts in the basement, he goes back down, gets the head, and then he puts it on a plate, and then he puts it in the fridge. Why? I'm not sure. It doesn't Jesus. really say. But, um, okay. So, spoiler alert. The body was actually his father. Well, uh, yeah. Donald uh, Meshi Sr. Um, so it says that he lived at their address since 18, 1985. Okay. So that they were at the house for like a while. Um, but yeah. Um, is he someone who has hallucinations often? He is someone who has definitely uh, been arrested for anger issues okay so this is probably a lie so he was a he was a truck driver mm -hmm. at one time and then um uh, as there's one report that says that he was i guess he was at a, a, a fill a, a pump you know filling up his truck and then i guess he had fallen asleep you okay. know just sleeping in this cab right and then uh one of the jockeys of the you know the the, the whatever you want to call it, the yard. Um, Woke him up? Yeah, he, he knocked on his door. You know, he told him, like, wake up. You got to move along. You're at a gas pump. Like, you can't be sleeping here. <laughs> so the jockey, you know, walks away. Then he gets attacked from behind by Meshi. Um, oh, no. And, yeah, and he's like, can't you let a man sleep? 
<laughs> that's what this is what he says. It's a quote. Wow. And yeah, so he he was um you know supposed to be going into anger management. I think this happened in 2019. So <clears throat> so yeah, two years ago. Wow. But yeah, um, th- now this thing with his father, it just happened this past week. Right. This was days ago. <laughs> Somebody sent me an email, like a, a, a TikTok message yeah. going like, hey, didn't you say you live not far from here? <laughs> it's not that close, there. but yeah, it's like 45 minutes away. Yeah. I used to live there. It's he a place w- I like to visit. I have friends there. <laughs> My family's there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Your whole family's in that piece. Yeah. Um. But yeah, um, so a woman, it says, let me quote this. Uh, so I got this from Penn Live. But um, it says, a woman who grew up with Messi Jr. stopped by the crime scene Thursday after hearing the unsettling news. I guess that he. Um, Good old Penn Live. Yeah, I know, right? So she told Ben Line she was shocked to hear that Messi, who had not talked to her in years, uh, allegedly stabbed someone to death and cut up his body. Uh, neighbors declined the interview, blah, blah, blah. No. No interviews. It is like this just happened. Um, and if anything updates on it, like, like he's he's not. I guess he's charged with it, but he's not like. Well, now they have to figure out. Like, is he just a liar? Is he not, if he's is, guilty of it? So yeah. yeah. So they're doing Does he an need investigation to be right now. Many yeah. choices. So as this story updates, I will keep you guys updated as well, or we'll keep you updated as well on this, but. Yeah, that's my story this week. A person who went to junior high with me and my family <laughs> um, was found, well, is accused of murdering his father and dismembering his body. Yeah, well, there you go. When Killers Get Caught is sponsored by the Magic Class Boutique. Now, why does that name sound so familiar? Well, it's because it's a business ran by our very own Brittany. That's right. The Magic Class Boutique is not only a black-owned business, it's a woman-owned as well. This is a jewelry company that makes some pretty awesome earrings, ranging from cute little sushis to spooky mermaid skeletons. There are even adorable self-defense keychains for those just-in-case moments. And introducing the Serial Collection. This set of earrings is based off of Serial Killers and the official merch for the podcast. This collection features everything a serial killer would need to pull off their crimes, from hunting knives at the beginning of their crimes to warden keys for when they eventually get caught. Check out themagicclasp.com today where you can use our promo code CAUGHT to receive 15% off of your online order. That's T H E M A G I C C L A S P dot com and use promo code CALT for 15% off and make sure you tell Brittany that I sent you. Well, sorry that we took so long with our stories today. I know some people get a little annoyed with that, but uh, if you're still here, thank you so much for listening. And uh, so, one of my sources last week was this marvelous book called Mistresses of Mayhem. And of course, it's all about women killers. Yes, I want to buy it. Right, yeah, because I told you that the I found two copies of the book, one with one last name and one with the other, and I which, wasn't sure which one is the current woman's last name who wrote this. Right, but I right, know right. one of the names is Hornberger. Um, and obviously, I used that for reference for the Dorothea Puente case, uh, but it's, a, it's full of many other horrible women. And as I'm going through this book, I see this picture and I have seen this woman's face dozens of times. I even talked about her crime on TikTok uh, not that long ago. I'm going to show you this picture because I'm sure you've seen it too. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. Sad yes, face. I have. It's a picture of Gertrude Benazewski. Zeski? Benazewski? We gonna mess that up all night. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And the thing is, I know her story. I know the fact that she horrifically 
horribly tortured a teenage girl for months on end between like 65 and 66, like crossing over the the winter time period. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that, you know, her teen children joined in. I discussed her, what happened to her and her children on TikTok who participated. Yes, I remember that. But one thing I have never, ever looked into was who the hell this weird lady must be. Hmm. And so that was what I set out to do, was to learn who she was, to see if there were any redeeming qualities in who she might have been at some point in her life. I doubt it. Uh, You know, I'm going to allow you and our listeners to decide how you feel about her by the end of this. I already think she's a shady person. (laughs) Not surprising. Not surprising. But uh, Gertrude Benazeski was born Gertrude Van Fossen. In late September of 1929, to Hugh Marcus Van Fossen Jr. and Molly Van Fossen in Indianapolis, Indiana. Just a month before the New York Stock Exchange would crash and plunge America into the worst financial crisis anyone had ever seen. She was the third of six children to a mixed race family of Polish and Dutch origin. In a world where no one had any money and there were too many children, uh, Gertrude was her father's favorite. They had so little in terms of resources that he tried to make up for it by showering her with like affection. Something that kind of faintly annoyed her siblings, but made her mother Molly feel very threatened. Mm. This was such a big deal in their household that Molly would try and separate Gertrude from Hugh, even when Gertrude was just a toddler. We're talking like two years old. Oh, wow. Uh, That obviously did not work very well. If you've tried to separate a toddler who's obsessed with someone, (laughs) there's just screaming that happens. Yeah. Um, So when that didn't work, what Molly started doing was whenever he wasn't around, she would just freeze her out. She just wouldn't talk to her at all. Why? Why would you not try to build a relationship with her? Mm -mm. And try to get her like on your side too? I think it's very peculiar when an adult woman is envious of children but it happens all the time Hmm. especially when people like get remarried and stuff and people don't like the behavior of the you know oh this person's spending more time with his daughter than me i see like articles like all the time on like uh like dating websites and on reddit and Hmm. like reddit relationships so this is fairly common it's just tragic okay um so gertrude's siblings were like We don't really want to be on the receiving end of this. So they decided to sort of side with her mom. Of course. (laughs) And so she very much grew up like she was an outsider, which didn't have the effect that they really wanted. Because at that point, then it was like Hugh was the only person who treated Gertrude like she was a person. So she clung to him even more. Um. Hugh didn't fully understand what was happening because when he came home, everything was normal. Mm -hmm. Um, And he didn't really ask his wife either, but he just went, well, she's being extra clingy when I come home. So I must mean I need to give her more attention. Right. Yeah. I mean, which was just a cycle that continued horrifically. That's shitty. Now. Yeah, it is. Uh, Molly had complete control of her other children And she very easily manipulated them into bullying Gertrude. Um, So that means that it began to extend from home into school. And then the other Van Fossen kids got other kids in school to bully her as well. On top of that, the whole country's in the middle of the Great Depression. He was cycling through jobs very fast. He starts drinking to deal with the feelings of inadequacy because he's struggling to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. Molly, for some weird reason, blames all of the troubles on Gertrude. But she knew that she couldn't do anything overtly to her husband's favorite child without making her husband angry. Um, And like I said, Gertrude having a pretty terrible childhood. Um, her dad's doing her best to make her happy, and then pretty much the worst thing that can happen did. Uh, it's 1940. Uh, they're in the kitchen, and Hugh and Gertrude are reading together. She wasn't the best student, but she tried. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he falls over, and he has a massive heart attack. Oh. Gertrude begins screaming. Molly runs into the kitchen. Um And the two witnessed his death. Um, 11-year-old Gertrude, I'm sure, knew 
that things weren't going to get better for her because Molly looked her in the face and said, what did you do to him? Wow. Yeah. Come on, hon. So Gertrude was blamed for her father's death, which is completely irrational. And like, you know, we've both lost people. So you understand that when you're in the throes of that kind of grief, like Mm -hmm. that's is it surmountable. It's like hard enough to do regular life things. But then to have somebody else go, well, it's your fault that person died. That's awful. Um, So she started having night these night terrors. And without Hugh to stop Molly, Molly began beating her because her night terrors would wake up the other children. <sighs> that went on for the next three years. Well, Hugh's not there anymore, so you don't have to be jealous of her anymore. You can start being nice to her. No, but now she's just shifted the anger in a different way. <sighs> you took my husband away from me. I didn't do anything. It's hard to say you can't. It's, but that also ties into the first time, too. You took my husband away from me because he loved you too much. I got to tell you, don't. I, I don't understand it. Just don't have babies if you're going to be jealous of your babies. Please. But like I said, that went on for three years. Um, and Gertrude kind of lived in this world where her mother either ignored her or beat the crap out of her. Mm-hmm. Um, her siblings were like, uh, yeah, listen, <sighs> we're just going to not do anything to help this situation. Mm-hmm. Molly is obviously deeply mentally unwell, but that doesn't matter at all. Um, Every problem in the house was a Gertrude problem to the point where it became a joke among the kids where, um, well, first it started out like, oh, there's not enough food in the house. Gertrude's eating too much. Um, And then the kids started making jokes. And like, if one of them were somewhere else in the house and they like tripped and fell, Mm -hmm. they would like laugh and go like, aha, Gertrude tripped me. (laughs) <laughs> that's not funny um, at school things weren't much better but they were bad in a different way um at 14 she started to have a little bit of like happiness mm-hmm. um this was a, a weird because molly had done a really good job of poisoning the minds of the other moms mm-hmm. and their little girls at school would repeat all the rumors that molly told wait wait a second the moms so she got no she got other so kids she would talk moms to the other moms and talk shit about her daughter yes so, uh, and then the daughters would find out from their moms bruh. and that would get repeated at school i'm already not okay bro <laughs> um bullshit. so but here's the thing 14 gertrude's hitting puberty mm-hmm. and while the little boys were pretty uninterested before then oh they hit her hard like a truck oh. they were very interested now and unfortunately this is very much like her getting the attention from her father only from teen boys oh no so this is even, oh god this is gonna be bad so the boys would be like really interested in her and like lunch and want to sit next to her and the thing is mind you molly's talking to all the other moms mm-hmm. so her their daughters would be like all the boys are focusing on gertrude so then she would come home and molly would be like super upset with her she's like you're talking to boys you know you're a slut how do you know i'm Um, talking to boys you're not in school (laughs) and gertrude's confused because she's like what am i doing that's wrong other than just talking to people who are like giggling around me like if people who want to be my friends and want to be nice to me also let's be real honest teenage boys were like yeah we all know (laughs) dorky you know what i mean so like nobody's doing anything yet it's me like (laughs) no oh gosh (laughs) Um, so Molly would yell at her about being seen with boys. And like at this point, Gertrude knows absolutely nothing about sex. She didn't understand why her mom was mad at her. But at this point, like she just didn't care. She's like, what are you going to do to me, Molly? Beat my ass some more. Mm-hmm. So yes. things did progress with the boys. And very quickly, Gertrude is very popular with them. And the same girls who are whisp- who whispered about her in the hallway for the last, like, five years are now kind of worried that Gertrude's going to steal your boyfriend because Gertrude will let the boys touch her under her shirt. Oh. And the thing is, she never was a great beauty. Okay. Um, and she didn't have a whole lot of a personality because she lived virtually in isolation in her house in silence. Right, right, yeah. Um, but like I said, uh, 
She let the boys touch her and she touched them. It's still pretty chaste, in my opinion, honestly. Like at 14, you're just touching a little boobies. Like that's really not the worst. Um, but rumors that she was doing way, way, way more were obviously spreading because that's how high school works. Of course. Um, the teachers were like talking about her like, oh, she's definitely going to get knocked up. You know how they talk. Yeah. Um, and the worst part here is like the rumor mill actually only made her life better because not only was it like the the freshman boys, but now the rumor was that she was the girl who would go all the way. So the older the boys started boys. talking, like looking at her and she had even more attention on her. Yeah. So at 15, Gertrude starts dating. Pretty much her mom's like, you're forbidden. Like, you can't do that. And she's just like, I can do what I want. You can't have fun. Um, some of the boys or men who would come to pick her up ranged from the ages of 17 to 23. Um, unsurprisingly, because the only positive relationship she's ever had was with an older man, she was drawn to older men, and they were drawn to her because of what everybody was saying about her, mm -hmm. which wasn't true. And that's why the next section is awful. Great. So Gertrude's 16. She drops out of school, packs up a couple things out of the house, and gets married to a man named John Benazowski. They'd only been dating for a few months. They had done virtually nothing together. This was pretty much the only option you have in 1945 if you want to start a new life. Find a man somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Their wedding was super small. It only had John's family. Uh, Gertrude really didn't have many friends. And uh, her mother was so loud about how she didn't approve of John. So she wasn't invited. How old was he? He was 18. Okay. Not and 20. she was 16. No, he was not one of the super old ones. Got it. <laughs> so uh, he was also a police deputy in Indianapolis. And although he wasn't making a lot of money... Uh, the bank, local bank was like, eh, you know, he's a cop. We'll give him the loan. So they got a house um, and moved into a nice little suburban home on the edge of Indianapolis. And they went on a honeymoon in Ohio. I just got to tell you, <laughs> Ohio is not what I think of when I think of a honeymoon. No, Ohio. I mean. But you know what? Maybe Cleveland was, you know. We, we love Ohio. Nice. Maybe Cleveland was a little bit better then. Yeah, yeah. Ohio's the greatest. I mean, I have my concert there <laughs> so you know the the big the music the festi festival you yeah, go to yeah yeah, okay. yeah so that's there so that's why i like ohio but okay um well very quickly after their honeymoon things began to sour uh gertrude didn't know how to be a wife let alone a housewife um she'd been taught almost nothing from her mother other than how to like clean um she couldn't cook and worst of all for John, he had heard all these raunchy tales about Gertrude being this sexual minx. And she was not experienced at all there. He's she, like, you do this and that and this and that. And no, what are you talking she's about? She's like, what's that? <laughs> well, so she did know how to clean, like I said, because her mom forced her to clean everything. So then she would get mad because John would come home and he would just like throw his stuff everywhere because he's a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. And so they're having arguments about different things. Um, so they're having, like, she's arguing about him being messy. He's like, you suck at sex. Um, and you also cook awful. So He's like, you can't cook at all. What's wrong with you? Oh, my God. They've been together for a year now. He's like, she's a terrible wife. I, he's like, I have been sold a bill of <laughs> terrible goods. <laughs> I've been sold so many lies. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> you stand on the throne of lies. Oh, my God. Um, the sex situation only got worse. Because um, here's the thing. So Gertrude's family was hyper, like super religious, which was very common of the time in the early 1900s in America. So she's like, sex is a mortal sin. And so she very much began to look at it like it was a, a chore in her marriage. Mm. Something she just had to do. Um and the thing is, when she was a teenager, she was clumsily touching other teenagers. John's not a teenager. At this point, he's 19. Okay. Um, he had some experience before they got married. He was expecting to get something better than he got before. Uh, sir, just teach her what you know and you're good to go. Well, the other issue is that, like, the, when I say she thought it was a mortal sin, he was expecting some level of, like, I'm interested in being here from her. Oh. She is not interested. She's just like, I have to do this because this is my, this is what God said I have to do. Mm -hmm. my to make a baby. A yeah. Um. So he's like, I've been hoodwinked, bamboozled. <laughs> 
And he like openly lets her know that he's not happy, which only makes her want to have sex less. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, she would remain almost motionless while they, we'll call it make love. Um, Mm. Really, it became a situation where John just sort of used her body and then went to sleep. It's... And if she denied him, then he would probably punch her in the face. So he he got either, I'm just going to lay here and let it happen, or her being like, please let me go to sleep. And if she didn't, he would hit her. Mm. And then she would just be like, fine, whatever, do what you're going to do. Um, and then those beatings continued out of the out of the bedroom. Specifically, whenever he said that she annoyed him. Which could be anything. Literally. Anybody can annoy you for anything. God. Well. And then she got pregnant. Hooray. You don't have to have sex for a while. That is exactly it. So the two began to go through these periods of happiness and also struggle. When Gertrude was pregnant, she began to focus on like the nutrition for her and the baby. Mm -hmm. So she started cooking better. Oh, great. And then she would clean the house constantly, regardless of what he did, because she said that she learned that, you know, newborns can get infections really easily. So she was like hyper cleaning the house, cooking like these excellent meals. John's like, this seems all right. Then the baby's born. And John's like, oh, she doesn't want to like deal with me at all now. She's focusing all of her attention on the baby. Baby girl, Paula. Oh. And so almost in a weird, ironic way, there's the same kind of jealousy. Mm -hmm. So it's just reverse. Yeah, but in reverse. Um, And pretty much the only time John wouldn't beat her was when she was pregnant. And she spent most of the next decade of their relationship pregnant. Mm. Um, Finally, she got pregnant four times. Finally, she divorced him in 1955. And she got married to a man named Edward Guthrie a few years later. Um, He was unemployed and very into the fact that Gertrude was getting a very large child support stipend for four kids. Um, Edward actively hated her children. So, you, yeah, you love the money, but you hate the kids. So much so that after he got a job, he moved out three months after they got married and he stood in the courtroom and told the judge, I don't like the kids. That's why we're getting a divorce. Wow. And she was just like, you know what? Fine. Go. Wow. So he's no. kind of chilling. You know, um, things are things are doing all right. Uh, one day, Gertrude's walking around town and she sees John. <laughs> And uh, she's just like, well, you know, I suppose you could come hang out. You know, the kids do like seeing you. Mm -hmm. So he visits more often. Um, Now she's a lot more uh, experienced after having been single for a little while. Uh, I'm sure she is. So he's a little happier in that department. Oh, Oh, hang out. You should have quoted. Well, (laughs) well, I didn't know. It didn't didn't start out that way. (laughs) It started out with. The kids being like really excited to see him and like, sure, you can come have dinner with us and be around the children. And then the children go to sleep and then well, you want to come stay with me. Uh, and then huh. it became John moved back in. <laughs> then you got to hang out, hang out. Got then they got to hang out, hang out. Um, They would have drinks and she would show him her, her new tricks. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and they got married again. Oh, God. OK. Things were going all right. He was like, we have these four kids. We're good. But obviously, um, in like, you know, I'm going to say like the late 50s, Mm. we we weren't real good with contraception. I mean, for real, people aren't very great at it now. This is true. Um, She got pregnant again. But she also had, then she had a miscarriage. Uh. She did not handle that well. Uh. Um, and John was not very supportive because they had stopped having sex, but they had stopped having sex because she was depressed. Yeah. He started to hit her again. She got pregnant again. 
This happened seven for seven more years. She'd get depressed, get pregnant, feel better. The cycle would go on. During the seven years, though, they did have two more children. This time, though, John filed for divorce. He was like, yeah, you know what? This was a bad idea. <laughs> it only took you seven years, buddy, but well, whatever. You know, I was there for the sex. The sex was great. It, it must have been. <laughs> Listen, Gertrude must have hit him with that wop. Because... Oh, my God. That's how to ow. Uh, yeah. But now she's single with six children. It's 1963. She's 37 years old. She has no income outside of her child support, and she's becoming slowly very unstable. Hmm. She can't seem to hold a job herself. She can't afford the mortgage payments. Then she meets this man named Dennis Wright. And he's 22 years old and married at the time. She was a lot older than him. And she definitely abused the crap out of that. Oh. Um, the day that Dennis's wife moved out of his house, Gertrude moved in with all six kids. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Dennis was an alcoholic prone to outbursts, but he was very happy with sex. Um, and he was like, you know what? Who cares? I'll pay for this big ass family. I'm getting laid like crazy. The house. But the problem was, um, after like a couple weeks, the house never got cleaned. And, and Dennis was kind of freaked out because she was getting kind of weird in terms of her emotional place in life. Hmm. So he actually planned like this elaborate escape. Like it was like a month. He was like, all right, listen. He's like, if I try and break up with her, she's just going to try and seduce me. And like, then I'm going to be stuck with her some more. So, um, one night he comes home and the kids are nowhere. Um, the house is spotless. Dinner is made. They have a nice meal. They go upstairs. They have sex. And she's like, hey, you know, have you thought about, like, a family with us in the future? And he's like, I don't want kids. What are you talking about? You have six kids. We get enough kids. And um, she says to him pretty much, huh, you should have thought about that before. Oh, she's pregnant. Yep. And that is also the first night that Dennis hit her. Uh, He actually beat her to the, he tried to make her miscarry. This was like a brutal beating. What is wrong with you? What the fuck? But I guess luck wasn't on Dennis' side because um, she did have a baby nine months later. Oh, my God. And she named him Dennis Jr. And when she returned home from the hospital, Dennis Wright Sr. was gone. You Not could've... just gone, but completely vanished. You could have done this before you like, thought of hitting her. I remember, it's still like 1960. Like, I don't care. You know, it's like 60. You know, I don't care about the times. Still shouldn't have done it anyway. Five ish. And she tries to tell people she's a widow. Mm -hmm. She she tries to tell people that um, she's trying to tell come up with any story. They go, oh, we got married. He's just gone for a little while. But the problem was like she's really struggling. Like, I think that cycle of having the constant miscarriages did something to her brain. Um, I can only imagine how many must have happened. Um, so it got to the point where sometimes she'd be telling people stories about Dennis and mid conversation, she would change why he was gone and she didn't realize she was doing it. Um, and probably the nicest thing that happens in this entire story, um, the neighbors realize that she definitely is incapable of keeping a job at this point. And they suddenly are like, you know what, Gertrude, you have all those kids. You're really good with kids. Can you watch our kids? And Hey, Gertrude, your house is always really neat. I see your laundry. It looks so nice. Do you want to come help me with my laundry? Oh, I'll pay you. That's nice. Of them. And yeah. yeah, pretty much her neighbors come up with a plan to help fund all of these children because they know that she cannot do it. Um, she babysat. She washed clothes. Um, at 1967, she has seven children total. Paula, who is 17. Stephanie, 15. John, 12. Marie, 11. Shirley, 10. James, 8. And Dennis Lee Wright Jr., who is 1. 
John's child support payments are not coming as often as they should have been. Hmm. Because he got mad after he heard about her fling with a younger man. Yeah, nothing to do with you, buddy. And during this time, Paula's oldest daughter, I mean, Gertrude's oldest daughter, Paula, mm-hmm. blah, 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 <laughs> uh, becomes kind of the matriarch of the family. Um, her her mom is fully breaking down at this point. Um, like Gertrude is chain smoking, barely eating, ha- losing her connection to what is real. Her hair is receding due to just no nutrition. Her eyes are sunken in. And um, to Paula, it, it seemed like Gertrude was pretty good with being miserable. Um, she would monitor her. The only reason why she monitored her children was that she didn't want them to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. That was like her biggest fear and something she began to fixate on. Like, you can't go with boys. You're going to get pregnant. Like one time, I guess, like Paula was in her room with a boy. And here's the problem, like with this whole situation with her and the I don't want you to get pregnant. She allowed like any kids in the neighborhood to hang out in her house. Mm. And she mainly laid in her bed and smoked and drank and did nothing. And occasionally she would come out. And unluckily for Paula, that one day, I had a boy in your room. She had a boy in her room, and her mom like burst through the door and is like, "Sinners!" Like just screaming at her. Um, and finally, like Paula's, I like Gertrude's, like, "Stop bothering me! Stop cleaning the house! Stop trying to make me eat food!" Oh wow! I'll let anybody come through here. I don't care. And so the kids are like, Moki. Um, and then there's a situation where Paula went out and she ended up in a hotel with a man. And after they did the deed, he put his wedding ring back on. Uh. She did not know. And she was very upset. So Paula is absolutely pregnant and ter- currently in the house with her mom trying to hide said pregnancy. The house is now the place for every teenager to come and get into trouble, even though it is a complete mess. Mm -hmm. This is also the time when Paula meets the Lycan sisters, Sylvia and Jenny. Um, She meets them through one of her friends named Darlene. Sylvia is a little bit younger than Paula and Jenny um, and had a. And Jenny is younger than Paula, has a leg brace from when she had polio. Um, Darlene was out and realized that they were pretty much homeless and brought them to her house and then convinces Paula to take them with her because she's like, well, your mom doesn't care who's there at the house. So this totally works. They can just hang with you. They all sit in Paula's room and Jenny and Sylvia kind of tell them about how like the night before their mom had them pack up all their stuff and run away from their father, Lester. Lester had hit mom. Mom's name is Betty. So Betty grabbed the girls and ran. Um, They get to Indianapolis after taking a bus and they have no money. Mm -hmm. And so Betty's like, okay, I'm going to go steal something from you from the store. Gets arrested. So then Sylvia pulls Jenny away because she's like, if they find out we're with her and we don't have an adult, we're going to just get locked up too. So they end up just kind of wandering around Indianapolis and that's where they ended up meeting Darlene. So Paula is like, come with me. And she has Sylvia go tell her mom the same story in her bedroom. Gertrude's like, okay, well, how about this? Stay the night. Tomorrow we'll go look around the police. We'll go to the police precincts and find out where your mom is. Mm -hmm. True to her word, the next morning at at like 10, 11, Gertrude's like, all right, we're going to go find your mom. And there's a knock on the door. There is Darlene and Lester Likens who had tracked his wife to Indianapolis because what happened is that when she got arrested, she gave them Lester's number. They had gone, he went to County jail. Um, they reconciled across the glass while they're in prison. I love you. I love you too. I'm so sorry. (sighs) He tells Gertrude, I have friends who work for a traveling circus. And we're going to go work for them and make really good money. But we don't want to take the girls all around like the area with us. So what if we pay you 20 bucks and they can live here? 20 bucks a day? A week. 
Okay. And Gertrude's pretty excited because she's like, ha, $20 in cigarette money? Dope. <laughs> Paula made it seem like she was happy. These two girls are going to stay in her room. But the real issue is that, like, Paula's hiding a pregnancy. And it's real hard to hide that from two other girls who are your same age. Right. There's things that should be happening that aren't going to happen. Yeah. For the first week, things are doing are pretty good. Sylvia and Jenny get set up in the new school. Um, they're following the house rules. One day they come home to a strangely silent house. And I am going to give anyone listening the pause. This is the trigger warning pause. Um, I'm not even going to go into all of the things that happened to Sylvia Likens from this point forward. I'm only going to hit the highlights of the next like year of this poor girl's life. Um, for folks who don't want to listen, uh, there will be liner notes. Mm -hmm. Just know that uh, torture happens and it goes on for quite a long time. Freddie Brian. No, okay. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, I'm here for a ride. I gotta be here. Let's go. So uh, since the two girls aren't really sure why the house is quiet and they're like, oh no, did we break a rule or something? They go up to Paula's room and Paula and Gertrude are there. And Gertrude is enraged. She's like, your dad told me this money would be here on this date. Um, she like, Paula grabs Sylvia, throws her onto the pile of clothes that she's sleeping on. It's not even a bed. It's like a pallet. Oh. Um, and Gertrude, like, like, they pull down her underwear and begin just, like, hitting her with a spoon. Um, then they grab Jenny and do the same thing. Hits them on their, like, thighs and legs. And she ends the beating by telling the girls, if your father doesn't pay me, you get beat. Um, what the f Gertrude takes pleasure in this. She even tells the girls right before she leaves, if he hasn't paid me by the end of the week, I'm renting you girls out a dollar a ride until the money shows up. What's that mean? She's going to prostitute them for a dollar a guy. Oh, I thought you said dollar a ride. That's what she said. A dollar a ride until I make my money. Oh. She meant ride in that way. Oh. 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 Okay. The worst part is Lester's check arrived the next morning. It literally got delayed in the post. Now don't you feel silly. You feel stupid for beating these children that aren't even yours. Well, the situation, though, is that what she realizes is she likes how powerful she feels oh god so now it's not gonna stop the next beating came when the lichen sisters realized that they could sell like old coke bottles mm -hmm. like those old school thick glass ones because they would recycle them and just reuse them and they would get really good money for them so they went and they bought a bunch of food and candy and stuff and um this is actually really messed up because Jenny was like, oh, we're about to eat all this. And Sylvia was like, no, no, no. We should take some back to the other Likens children, you know. And so they come back and they give the money to the other kids. And Gertrude is like, you stole that. And Sylvia's like, no, this is my own money. Jenny, who is still raw from the other beating, is silent. Mm. Paula and Stephanie come in and watch as Gertrude just like chants like thief, liar, thief, liar. And the other two girls join in. Finally, Jenny tell like, mind you, the whole time she's doing this, she is hitting her. Mm. Um, finally, Jenny told Gertrude that they'd stolen the candy um, that way to stop the beating. From this point on, Jenny and Sylvia try to be perfect house guests. They are silent. They try not to be a bother. They try to avoid Gertrude entirely and just go to school. Um, they even stop trying to really make friends um, because they're worried about the fact that the Likens children have always goes, gone to these schools. Right. Um, Gertrude is not feeding them. Like barely at all. So one night, all the kids have to go to this church function in place of Gertrude going because Gertrude doesn't go anywhere. She just lays in her filth and enjoys being an awful person. Right. The local preacher notices that both Jenny and Sylvia seem a little weak and it had been three days since either of them had eaten anything. So when the preacher offered them food, they couldn't say no. And funny enough, Jenny was the one who ended up kind of gorging herself on food. But Sylvia was like, I need to like show some restraint. Mm -hmm. 
She goes home. Sylvia tucks Jenny into bed. And then she's like, you know what? I should just go to sleep. And then I guess she sort of changed her mind. And she goes back downstairs. There's Gertrude sitting with all of her children. Gertrude calls her a pig. And it's just like, I heard you were out bringing shame to my name again. As if anyone could shame you more than you've already been, Gertrude. But regardless. God. Okay. Um, Gertrude's in ra- like so mad about the food thing and how like, oh, people are going to think that I didn't feed you. Well, you don't. So she drags Sylvia into the kitchen, pulls out a stale hot dog bun and like an old sausage, drenches it in mustard and ketchup and tries to force feed her. Um, screaming the entire time about how Sylvia is going to get fat. Nobody's going to want her. She'll end up alone. Um, uh, through this process, Sylvia does begin to vomit. Mm-hmm. Um, and Gertrude forces her to eat the finished hot dog and then to eat the regurgitated hot dog again. <sighs> like, like with her foot on her like back, mm-hmm. dragging her head across the floor. It's terrible. Um, all of the Banazeski children watched her do this. And then Gertrude picked her up, wiped her off, and told her, I only punish you because I care about you. No. Mind you, I'm going to also let you know that a lot of these stories come from Stephanie Banazeski. Mm-hmm. Um, because at the inevitable trial that happened, she... I mean, she was the one that... She turned on the family yeah. and told everything. So these are the things that Stephanie was there to see. A week later, Sylvia meets with Lester and Betty. Gertrude organizes this so that they don't see the inside of the house. The whole family gets on a bus and goes to Garfield Park. Um, Betty's like, why are they so skinny? And Gertrude's like, oh, Paula's like on a diet. And so the girls decided they were going to help her with it. So they're on a diet, too. Um, Pretty much Gertrude lies and lies and lies some more Um, on all the while just staring Sylvia straight in the face. Daring her. Contradict me. I dare you. Um, Jenny hadn't witnessed the other, the the thing that had just happened mm-hmm. the week before. Um, so she was like, we're fine. All that happened to Jenny was she got spanked one time. Right. It was weird because she's like 14. But, you know, um, in the end, Betty hugs her daughter's. And she's like, I'm so happy. You guys just started going to church. That's amazing. On the way home, Gertrude's like, this is great. We're going to be friends now. And. No. Well. No friends. I believe in in Jenny's testimony. She said it was almost worse that they believed her. (sighs) It's terrible. Because they let their guard down. Yeah. So they tried to be friendly with Paula and Stephanie. So. I'm going to say that this is when things go from the abuse that the kind of abuse that Gertrude experienced when she was younger Mm -hmm. into a completely different territory. Um, So all the teenagers are downstairs in the living room and they're all talking about their experiences with the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And so Jenny's like, I only kissed a boy. And like, that was like a, like a year ago and we never talked to each other. Sylvia is like, well, when I lived in Florida with my parents, I went steady with a boy and she said that she let him touch her over her sweater Mm -hmm. and everyone's like, Ooh, ah." Gertrude's even there. And she's like, Oh, but when Sylvia tells her story, Gertrude snaps, slaps her in the face, calls her a whore in front of all the other kids. Sylvia's like, what? I, I didn't, what do you mean? I'm a whore. I've never even had sex before. Yeah. And, She's like, I haven't even gotten past first base. But, like, Gertrude literally, like, hits her so hard she falls to the floor. Her head hits the wall on the way down. She's screaming the entire time that she's a prostitute. Everybody knows. Um, The neighborhood children are like, the fuck is going on? Um, Gertrude's like, oh, I bet you're pregnant right now anyway. Um, she's like, you, you know, you let a boy put his dirty parts down there. Like she's using some real like Come carry on. language. Yeah. Your um, billy pills. Then Gertrude somehow like spins the story that obviously Sylvia had accepted all that candy for sex. That's why she had that candy really? from like a month ago. 
Um, and she's like, as she's telling this story, like, oh, I bet you that's how you got all that candy. You must have like exchanged candy for sex. She is physically stomping on Sylvia's crotch. Oh. Like full. Um, she demands that some of the neighborhood boys like hold Sylvia. What the? F- and they do. Um, they hold her legs in place so that Gertrude can continue like kicking her. Um, at one point, like they got tired and like the one boy dropped her leg and was like exhausted. And so Sylvia manages to get up, barely able to stand. And she goes to sit in a chair and Gertrude grabs the chair like from out from under her and literally says, whores are unfit for chairs. What the f- And from that moment forward, she was not allowed to sit anywhere in the house. Uh, if you're still listening, it gets worse from here. Gertrude would even come into her bedroom and like throw the little pallet across the room. Oh, come on. You can't lay down. Fuck you. What are we going to do? I don't sleep like a horse. I don't stand up. Well, the next thing that happens is quite possibly like there's a, a discussion on this of whether this rumor about the Banaszewski kids came from Sylvia or if it just came from the other kids being there at the house. Mm hmm. But regardless, there are these rules. There's these rumors about the Banaszewski girls. No one is like, we can't say anything. Like, there's no rumors about Sylvia because Sylvia is literally like the most innocent of innocent there at school. Mm -hmm. Paula and Stephanie didn't hear these rumors, but they knew something was going on because whenever they would walk in a room, people would get quiet. Of course. You know people are talking about you when that happens. Mm -hmm. And the first rumors are that um, the house is filthy. But it also has rumors about places that other kids aren't allowed to go. Um, That's why people thought it was Sylvia that told these rumors. One teen boy had the courage, and his name was Coy Hubbard. He also was in love with Stephanie. So he decides he's going to go right up to the Banaszewski house, talk to Gertrude, and he's like, Sylvia and Jenny are spreading lies about my girl and you. Oh, Wait, he did this? He Yes, he goes straight to the house. Oh, no. Sylvia gets home from school, and Koi is right in her face, and he's like, why are you talking shit about my girlfriend? He's oh like, why did you say Stephanie's a slut? As soon as Stephanie hears that, she's like, wait, what? Oh, my God, no. And Sylvia's just like, I've never said anything. Why would I say anything about you? Like, I barely know you. Yeah, I don't really care about you right now. She's like, the rumors that could have come from any of the teenagers you allow to be in this place. Right, right. As it is. But, like, no one's listening to her. Koi, who is studying judo, proceeds to beat the ever-living crap out of her. <laughs> Um, and the other issue is that Sylvia was underfed, undernourished, and had never been in a fight in her life. Yeah. Um, the other children watch in silence. Um, Koi flips her around the room several times before Gertrude's like, you're messing up my living room, kid. And then she walks over, opens the door to the basement and goes, take her down there. Come on. Pretty much alone with her in the basement, he just preached her like a human punching bag. Um, when Koi is exhausted, he leaves the basement and Gertrude's like, you know what? You should come back for more practice. Um, Sylvia's so stiff. She can barely move. She finally crawls her way back up the steps. And uh, Gertrude's like, well, it's not like anybody's going to believe what you're saying about my kids. Um, Sylvia stays home for a couple days. Gertrude tells her school she has the flu. Most of the bruises fade from purple to green, and they finally get to that ugly yellow color. Mm -hmm. Um, And Stephanie and Paula share their makeup with Sylvia to help her hide her bruises. Um, Sylvia stops talking really to mostly to anybody at school. She's like, no one can say that I said something if I never talk at all. Koi starts coming, coming by regularly. He didn't beat her up as badly as he did the first night, but he does still, like, flip her around. Really? Like she's a a judo doll. Really? He just comes over and just... (sighs) So, Sylvia does make, like, one friend, despite the fact that she's really trying not to. Right, yeah. This little girl's name was Anna. She was actually, like, a freshman. She's only, like, 13. And she, like, Anna's just like, I really want to come see where you live. And, like, Sylvia's like, no, you don't. Mm-hmm. so finally she can't give enough excuses at this point 
She's like, fine. I'm sure Anna will take one step into the house and see the pile of garbage in the living room and like turn around. Mm -hmm. But when they come in, Gertrude's in the living room and she's so excited. Oh my gosh, you have a friend? You should go get her a Coke and we'll wait here in the living room for you. When Sylvia walks back in, Anna attacks her. What the hell? Gertrude had told Anna that Sylvia has been talking about her mother. In just a minute, Gertrude had removed the only friend that Sylvia had made. Why are you doing this? So then Anna told other people at school, and now Sylvia is really isolated there. Oh, my God. Other girls from school attacked her, too, based on things that Gertrude said. Um, A few times, Sylvia even tried to defend herself. She's like, listen, I don't know you. Why would I lie about your family? One night, um, like a girl was in the living room. Her name was Judy. And Gertrude was like, you know, she's been talking all this stuff about you and your mom. And Gertrude was just like, you know, you should hit her for how what she says about you. And Judy was like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't I didn't hear her say anything. Mm -hmm. So Judy leaves. Someone smart. Yay. Okay. And so Gertrude then demands, well, if Judy's not going to hit you, Jenny should hit you. Jenny refuses. And Gertrude's like, well. If you don't hit her, I'll I'll hit you. Like, hit me. Hit me. I don't care. So Jenny is just sobbing. Gertrude hits her so hard she loses her balance and falls because she has the, the messed up leg. Mm-hmm. Um Sylvia is like like begs Jenny. She's like, for the love of God, just do it. Um and Jenny ends up punching her sister repeatedly until Gertrude is satisfied. At first They try to hide this abuse. Like I said, they do the makeup, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But Sylvia is showing up bruised more and more often. Coy is allowed to come in and throw her around whenever he wants. Um, Honestly, they weren't really watching him. And so he was uh, already kind of a dark kid. But now he's being allowed to explore that like creepy killer stuff with her. So sometimes he's down there just choking her until she passes out. Real Uh. creepy stuff. Um. One of the things about this case that really just purely pisses me off is the sheer volume of witnesses. Um, So in August of 1965, new neighbors move into the, like next to Gertrude. Mm -hmm. Their names are Phyllis and Ray Vermillion. And I'm naming them because they should be ashamed. After seeing all of the kids, the Vermillions thought that Gert would be, you know, Gertrude would be a good babysitter. Right. The Vermillion family sets up this big backyard barbecue so the families can meet each other. Sylvia shows up with a black eye. Paula straight up goes, oh, yeah, I did that. And they're like, why? At the same party, Paula goes into the kitchen, boils some water, scoops a cup, and walks up and throws it on Sylvia. No. Oh, my God. The Mermillion family never reports it. Oh, my God. Two months later, um, they go to Gertrude's house to borrow something. And they see Sylvia in the house with a black eye that is so bad that it's swollen shut and her lips are swollen. And she's walking around almost like out of it. Mm -hmm. Probably at this point, she has like a concussion. Um, Paula again tells Phyllis, yeah, I did that to her. And then she takes off her belt to show Phyllis how she beats Sylvia and hits her in front of Phyllis. This was also not reported. Shortly after that, Sylvia asked, said, told Gertrude that she had to get a tracksuit for gym class. And Gertrude's like, no, I'm not spending money on you. And it puts Sylvia in this terrible position where she's freaked out because if she doesn't have the tracksuit that everyone has to wear mm-hmm. at gym time, they're going to call Gertrude and complain. Right. And then Gertrude will be mad. Because she didn't. Because she doesn't have what she needs for school. Yeah. So she steals one and she just hopes that that kid doesn't care that it's gone. She gets away with it at school, at least. But Gertrude sees the tracksuit when Sylvia is washing her clothes. Gertrude beats her, but also takes a cigarette and burns each of her fingers in front of the teenagers at the house. At this point, I think the teenagers are so desensitized to what they're seeing that no one even objects to it at this point. And they all take turns burning her, too. Like they, they, like she became like their human ashtray. Mm-hmm. 
She is malnourished. She barely can sleep. She's in so much pain. Her body just stopped healing at this point. Koi even noticed that her bruises weren't fading anymore. And it's at the, like this is kind of the, the place point where things are going to start to shut down soon. Mm-hmm. Gertrude had convinced everyone that she was a liar. So Sylvia didn't feel like she had anybody she could talk to. Um, the only time she ate was when she could collect a couple Coke bottles and buy some food for herself on the way home before Gertrude could see it. She would sit on like a park bench and then sneak back in the house. Um, question. Yeah. N- N- How do I ask this? How is Jenny? Jenny is trying to avoid everybody. She will try to help in her own way fairly soon, mm-hmm. but um... <sighs> okay, okay, go ahead, keep go, continue with this. The next situation that happens is a really bad one. Um, <sighs> one day she comes back. Gertrude is waiting for her. She doesn't even know why she's being beaten at this point. She just kind of lets Gertrude drag her around the house. Finally, though, Gertrude drags her into the living room. There's no other teens in the house other than boys. She forces Sylvia to strip in front of all the boys, hands her a Coke bottle, and like demands she put it inside of herself. Um, at some point during this, Sylvia passes out from just the pain. Mm-hmm. Um, the next morning, Sylvia begs to be taken to a doctor. She's like, something is wrong. Um, Gertrude beats her some more. Um, the, the issue is that she is now almost incontinent. Like she can't control her bladder at this point from whatever happened with the bottle. Right. Um, Gertrude's just like, um, well, take her upstairs, throw her in the hot water, you know, since she pissed all over the bed and everything else. And one of the boys like refuses to do that. His name is Ricky. And um, Gertrude actually coerces this 14 year old boy to essentially further sexually assault Sylvia through the use of sexual favors. Mm. Yep. Um, Essentially, though, I, I would say I would say assault in the way of. They take her up to the bathroom, they take off her clothes, and they, like, forcibly clean her and then throw her back in the basement, according right. to what Gertrude says. Right. And this would go on every day. Um, in fact, and this is this is probably pretty awful, but the Benazeski children start charging money to other teenagers to come see Sylvia laying in the basement, mm-hmm. um, which she's being locked in now at night, um, and sometimes charging money to push her down the steps. She's being kept constantly naked, barely fed. When they do feed her, it's bizarre in a dog bowl. Or like one time they'd be like, you hear soup, but you have to eat it with your hands. It was just, this is all amusement for Gertrude's destructive mind. At some point, the 12 year old John joins in and comes up with the idea that she should eat her own feces in the basement. Oh my God. Um, so, all these kids that are coming to pay money, they they they, they don't like just because she's naked. They like, oh well, you know. Yeah, but they for twenty five cents you can come see her. Her they, boobs are out. They don't they don't tell stories around school. No nobody hears about this. No parents hear. No parents, at least not the way. If they do, then maybe they don't believe it. <sighs> okay. Well, there is a, a second chance at rescue happens. A local pastor is visiting the homes of his parishioners. He sits in the kitchen. Literally, Sylvia's in the basement. Gertrude's like, oh, I was taking care of this girl. She's a sinner. She's been sleeping with married men. Paula wandered in during the conversation. And there is this the juxtaposition of there's a pastor sitting in the chair. Paula's wearing baggy clothes because she's trying to hide the fact that she's like four months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And there's Gertrude talking about how oh, I bet you she's pregnant. She's fucking all these people. And Paula's just like, mm-hmm. wow. The reverend's like, well, I'll, I'll pray with you and maybe, you know, I'll come back 
and we can pray with Sylvia too when she's here. And Paul is like, I hate Sylvia. And like, um, Gertrude's like, no, 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 you don't hate her. You hate what she's doing. She wants to make sure, you know, hate the sinner, hate the sin, not the sinner. Um, the reverend's like, I'm going to come back, but he never comes back. Come now, on. Jenny tries to reach out to her parents. But since they move weekly due to the movement of the traveling like circus, yeah. it's very difficult. And Gertrude is holding on to the information as close as she can. So like she would get a letter back from she would get a letter with the money right. and that would have the current address. And by the time the girls got the, the letter, they'd already moved on. Right. Um, they did have a grandmother, but that grandmother was taking care of Jenny's twin brother, Benny, and she was old. They have an older sister named Diana. And when Sylvia is locked in the basement, Jenny's like, I'm going to write to Diana. She writes this whole huge letter begging her sister to, like, um, call the police. Diana didn't believe her. Why? And it, what she said was that um, Jenny and Sylvia had tried to move in with her before. Um, but as Diana's looking over the letters, she's like... This is too detailed. Like, where is this coming from? Like, this is not like, oh, these people beat me. Come pick me up so I can come live with you and your husband. Like, these are very detailed accounts of abuse. Yes, come from actual experiences. Please come get us. So Diana decides to visit the area and she decides to stop by the house. And Gertrude opens the door and is like, you aren't welcome here. Gertrude tells her, Lester called me and told me you can't see them. Diana's like, that's weird. Why would Lester say that? And she's just like, um, I don't know. That's between you and your dad, but you can't come here because you don't have permission. So Diana's like, okay, sure. She walks down the street and then she waits because she's like, at some point, they're going to come out of this house. One of them is going to come out. Mm -hmm. So about two hours later, Jenny's dragging this gigantic plastic bag outside and Diana runs up to her expecting Jenny to hug her. And Jenny's just like, I can't talk to you. You have to go away. So... Diana's like, now I'm really confused. You just called me saying these people hate our monsters. Yeah. So Diana calls Indianapolis Social Services. Thank you. And she just goes home and she's just like, all right. Gertrude was ready for this. A couple days later, um, the social worker arrives. Jenny is there, dressed beautifully, along with all the other girls. Uh, Sylvia is in the basement. Jenny has been told to play along or she will end up in the basement as well. The social worker is told that Sylvia got kicked out several weeks ago because Gertrude found out she was a prostitute. The social worker closes the case. There was another situation where they were almost found out by a man who the Banaszewski children robbed. Like he legitimately showed up at their house and was like, your kid stole my shit. And then he starts just pushing his way through the house to find his stuff. He makes it into the kitchen and Coy Hubbard and uh, Ricky tackle him. Mm. and they drag him outside. Um, <sighs> Coy Hubbard is a problem. Um, and there's such an interesting thing because now they've allowed him to, for months, get these weird, creepy, dark fantasies out. He's like being weird and creepy with Stephanie too. Mm. And she doesn't like it. She's like, as soon as, like, she's like, it's fine when they're around the other children, but as soon as, like, they would be, like, alone in her room, he would be, like, almost sexually violent with her. Oh. And I'm like, not a surprise. He's allowed to do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah. Um, Gertrude's getting mad now because despite all the horrible stuff that they're doing to Sylvia, Sylvia's spirit is not broken. Like, Gertrude would walk down the steps and Sylvia would just stare at her with, like, daggers. As you should. So, Gertrude is like, well, if she stays downstairs, she never does anything wrong. So I'm going to let her come upstairs because then she'll get in trouble and I can punish her. So even though Sylvia had drank no water that day, um, like I said, she'd been rendered incontinent by the bottle. Right, yeah. So she still peed the bed at night. Gertrude came in the room, screamed at her, threw old clothes at her, dragged her downstairs. When she realized there were only boys in the house again, she had Sylvia strip again. She did the same thing with the bottle a second time. This time, Sylvia just kind of stared at her and did it. She didn't flinch. She didn't cry. She was giving Gertrude nothing. Gertrude's pissed. She's like, I want to see her screaming and crying like she used to. 
but she's doing everything I'm asking her to do. So then she has the boys hold her down and she takes a needle and they heat it on the stove. And Ricky helps Gertrude come up with the words. I'm a prostitute and I'm proud of it on her stomach. Oh, after it was done, Shirley, the younger daughter, asks Sylvia, well, how do you feel about being branded? And Sylvia just goes, I guess there's nothing I can do. It's there. Also pisses Gertrude off. So she let Coy throw her around in the basement some more. But that wasn't fun either because Sylvia had stopped reacting. I'm assuming at this point she's disassociating. Yeah, she's in her own world yep. now. She's- at this point, that night, Jenny went down to see her. And Sylvia told her sister, I'm going to die. I can tell. Um, Jenny ran upstairs and hid before Gertrude could see her trying to console her sister. Gertrude sat on the steps and stared at her before inviting her to come back upstairs. The next morning, they bathed her, dressed her really nicely, and forced her to write a letter to her parents telling her that she'd gone with a group of boys. They had assaulted her and hurt her and branded her. This was the letter that was going to prove that Sylvia had run away and Gertrude was planning on just dumping her somewhere outside. At this point, Sylvia ran for the door. She's like, they're going to murder me. Mm -hmm. And she just runs for the door. Gertrude grabs her, drags her back, attempts to like thrust like a pole down her throat and knock her to the floor. At some point, they try and give her like crackers and water. And she tells Gertrude, you should give it to a dog. It's hungrier than I am. Mm. Um, Gertrude beats her again. The next morning, Koi and Gertrude come into the basement. Sylvia's in the same spot where she'd been. Gertrude tries to attack Sylvia and misses and hits herself. <laughs> like she literally like misses, hits the wall, hits herself. Koi is staring at her like, who is this stupid old lady? Oh, thank God. Um, a funny moment. Yay. <laughs> he took ask. the curtain rod from Gertrude and beat her until he was sure she was unconscious. Sylvia woke up in the middle of the night. Um, she was unable to scream because of the, the thing with them trying to thrust mm. something down her throat. Mm-hmm. So she found like a metal spade and she began hitting the wall all night long. The sound actually was loud enough that it woke people up in the area, but none of them called the police because they were used to weird sounds coming from the Benazeski house. The next morning, Ricky and Stephanie pick Sylvia up. They take her into the bathtub. Her head falls below the water and they don't see any air bubbles. Stephanie tries to do CPR, and that's when they realize that she is cold. It is October 26, 1965, and Stephanie was 16 years old. Hey, Sylvia. Gertrude had her put in the basement, and so she calls the police across the street. She hands the police officers the note, and they're like, this is weird. Because, okay, I'm going to tell you this because I saw part of the letter. The letter is addressed to Dear Mr. and Mrs. Betty and Lester Likens. What child writes a letter to their parents and uses their official full name? No. You would just say, dear mom and dad. So that was already stupid and weird. Yeah. But it gets more. Like, this just gets... (sighs) All right. right. So, like, the officers... Like, the, the other issue, though, is that they're like, this is the wife of a former officer. I guess they were still viewing her, even though they're ex-wife. They're Mm. like, we still have to, like, take care of her. As they are leaving, Jenny whispers to a police officer, if you get me out of here, I'll tell you everything. So the officer is like, you know what? I really need to question everybody here alone. And he, like, looks to Jenny and he's just like, I'm going to start with you. As soon as they are in the next room, Jenny goes, look in the basement. They killed my sister. (sighs) <sighs> he goes down into the house everyone is arrested who was there that day yay except for jenny of course um that's gertrude paula stephanie john jr coy and ricky all arrested for murder and the other teenagers are arrested for assault like pretty much everyone in the house um and the whole time gertrude is still like raving and ranting giving the same story mm-hmm. so the autopsy is done it corroborates a lot of the different stories stories from jenny some from stephanie um she had over 100 different cigarette burns on her body 
Some were second and third degree burns. She had severe bruising along with muscular and nerve damage. They weren't entirely sure if she just suffered a brain hemorrhage or this was just the combined shock of all of her injuries hitting her at once. Right. I'm going to say it was probably shock. I think the fact that she was able to tell her sister, I think this is the end for me today. Mm-hmm. Um, when they attempted to do like a full body exam, her throat and her vagina were swollen shut, but she was inspected and doctors were able to report that Gertrude was full of shit. And nothing she had been telling any adult for the last, like, nine months was I, accurate. I like how you said that. Oh, the doctor <laughs> the, the doctor has concluded that you are full of shit. <laughs> the lie detector just determined you're, <laughs> you're full of shit, Gertrude. Oh, my God. Sylvia was definitely not a prostitute. Um, unfortunately, the lesser charges are dropped almost immediately um, in favor of murder for Gertrude, Stephanie, Paula, John Jr., Coy, and Ricky. Hmm. Stephanie immediately turns state's evidence and the murder charges are dropped against her. Like I said, the majority of the things that I told you about today come directly from her testimony during her trial and to the police. Gertrude's trial was first, May 1966. She denied knowing anything about the torture. She entered a not guilty by reason of insanity plea. Um, She absolutely was insane, but her testimony was so bizarre that it made the jury dislike her. She would go on and on about how Sylvia was the town whore and she deserved what happened to her when the evidence was that Sylvia had had no sexual experience and nothing had been done to her genitals outside of the abuse that you did. Mm -hmm. Um, Gertrude's 11 year old daughter, Marie originally testified in her defense because that's what her mom wanted her to do. And then during cross examination, she broke down and started crying and just was like, my mom, this is all a lie. Um, May 19th, 1966, a jury finds her guilty of first degree murder. The public are shocked that Gertrude is not given the death penalty. Right. 1971, she somehow manages to get a retrial because they got some of the previous evidence thrown out. She gets the same penalty. Despite the citizens of Indiana fighting against it, Like, they actively tried to get her parole, like, ruined, like the people of Indiana. (laughs) Um, They She was paroled in 1985. She changed her name back to Fan Fossen. She died of lung cancer five years later. She never took responsibility for any of her crimes. She swore she could never remember between the drugs and the alcohol. Her total time served was 20 years. I fucking hate it. Not, Not not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. Paula was found guilty of second degree murder. Paula actually gave birth during her first trial and it had to be rescheduled. Uh. That did not stop the jury from recommending life in prison for her, though. She also got an appeal because of that situation with the evidence in 1971. And instead of going back to trial, she just agreed to manslaughter. They gave her uh, 25 years. Even though Paula participated, actually it was like 2 to 21, but regardless. Even though Paula participated in a prison riot and an attempted prison escape, they still released her a year later. I fucking hate Like she only served like I think an additional like three more years total because it was parole and then she was officially done by 73. She changed her name to Paula Pace and nobody heard anything about her until 2012 when the people of Iowa discovered who she was. She was working as a teacher. Oh, that's right. Yes. In the Marshalltown, yep, in Marshalltown, which was the Conrad school system. She had two adult sons at the time. Um, she was promptly fired for lying on her application. Um, we haven't heard anything from her since. We assume that she has probably changed her name again. Mm. Like I said, Stephanie served no time. She changed her name, moved to Florida, got married, had children, also became a teacher. John Jr. was sent, convicted of manslaughter and sent to the Indiana State Reformatory, where he was the state's youngest inmate at 12 years old. He was released two years later, uh, changed his name to John Blake, uh, and found God. As a man of God, he condemned his family, and he is the only Banaszewski family member to ever show any remorse for his participation in Sylvia Likens' murder. He died at 52 years old from cancer in 2005. Um, He was a real estate agent and a minister who had three children. Hmm. 11-year-old Marie served no time in exchange for her testimony against her mom. Once she turned to supporting the prosecution, they were like, it's all right. She's 11. We're not going to do this to her. 
Um, she apparently still lives somewhere in Indiana. Shirley was 10. She served no time. The only thing that Shirley participated in was branding Sylvia, and that was she was the one who heated up the needle. Right. Um, her whereabouts are unknown today. James was eight. Nothing is known about him other than that he served no time. And since Dennis Jr. was still like two years old, right. all we know about him is that he was put into foster care. He was adopted by a family like with the last name White, and that he died in 2012. Now let's talk about the people who weren't in the family. Yes. Coy Hubbard was convicted of manslaughter for his judo attacks on Sylvia. He served two of his 21 year sentence before he was released. I fucking, he never changed his name. He stayed in Indianapolis most of his adult life and uh, not surprising for anybody. He ended up in jail again for a murder charge in 1982. She's still in there. He was acquitted. Mother. Now, there is a movie that came out in 2007, which is probably where you saw this story, called An American Crime. Yeah. After that movie came out and everyone was like, oh, that's the same Coy Hubbard that we know from around the way. He lost his job and he died a few months later in June of 2007. Ricky Hobbs was convicted of manslaughter. He served two years before he was released. Um, unlike John, who became a better man after being in prison, Ricky was not. Um, he did eventually admit that he did something wrong. Oh. But he also was super messed up from probably participating in the violence, from the sexual abuse from Gertrude, from being in prison. He pretty much just had a nervous breakdown after his release. Uh, and he died of cancer in 1972 at the age of 21. Lester and Betty never recovered. Lester had actually been to the house only a few weeks before Sylvia died. And so he blamed himself for never seeing what was going on. Mm -hmm. He died in Fontana, California, February 2013 at the age of 86. Betty did not forgive Lester and she divorced him a year after the trial. She remarried and she died May 29th, 1998 at 78, 71 years old. She was buried next to her own brother at the Crown Hill Cemetery. Diana Likens definitely stayed off the radar. Um, she was not charged with anything because the state thought that she did as best she could. She told all the authorities, just nobody listened. Yeah. Um, weirdly enough, recently both Diana and her husband got lost in a California like wilderness. Oh no! And they were stranded in their car for two weeks. Her husband died from a heart attack in the car, oh, no. but Diana was found. Um, her children are taking care of her still. Okay. Finally, Jenny Likens lived with immeasurable guilt about what happened to her sister. Um, she was actually adopted by the family of the prosecutor, Leroy New. Leroy had several daughters that were the same age as her, and they tried very much to love her as she had never been loved before. Um, she has been described as a nervous recluse after this. She lived her life very much afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. um, even though she was afraid when Gertrude's second trial happened, she came forward and she spoke out against Gertrude being released, which is, I'm sure, the deciding factor between her. Because when Gertrude went to prison, she became a model prisoner. Of course. Everybody called her mom. She never did anything wrong. So when that trial happened in 72, they were like, why shouldn't we just like let her go? Time served. She's already been in prison for like five years. And Jenny was like, excuse me. Sorry about that. But, um, she beat me and my sister horrifically, constantly. Um, so, yeah, that Jenny mustered up enough courage to face her abuser in court in 1972. Um, friends of Jenny say that the fatal heart attack that she died from in 2004 actually happened because a pizza delivery driver startled her when he knocked on the door. Oh. She was 54 years old and she lived in Beech Grove. Most of the people who are listening right now know this story. Um, like I said, the tales of what happened to Sylvia were pulled from many different bits of testimony from all of the Gertrude's torture crew of kids. Um, it is highly likely that there is more that happened that we will never know. Because there are probably things that Gertrude did on her own and she died. She took that to her grave. Yeah. 
One thing that I will say um, is that I think it's very interesting that everyone who took part in abusing this girl died fairly quickly after it was all said and done. Yeah. Like maybe we didn't get justice in the courts, but uh, karma took its hold. I was about to say karmic justice. Like Gertrude got out of prison and it was like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't get to enjoy your life. Lung cancer. You spend your last couple of years in horrible pain. But yeah, it's interesting, right? She ended up worse than she started. Yeah. But like, it was almost exactly the same way that her own mother had been Yeah, with her. Which doesn't make anybody feel any better. No, by the way. not no. I still think she's a piece of shit, and I'm glad. She did. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I assume like, she I, would. I felt sorry for her because for just a brief moment, you yeah, felt bad for, for this the be- lady. The beginning of the the episode, yeah, I was. I felt sorry for her. Right but... when her she's been abused by her mom, you feel so bad for her. And then as things go on, I, I, pretty much from the point where she like starts sexually like abusing her like boyfriend yeah and like sexually coercing him i'm like oh no that's when it's like she's never gotten better but yeah i i went down this path because i wanted to know who the monster was Hmm. and it turns out she was a monster for a very long time and there were very few very few redeeming qualities from gertrude banizeski or paula banizeski or stephanie banizeski no they really didn't have any because like i mean they were abused but that's not a redeeming quality for nope. anybody so and they, it's, it's one of those weird situations where like you come across somebody like i'll use the example of chris brown mm-hmm. after that situation happened with rihanna he came went on like late night tv and he like talked about how like it was wrong but he himself was abused by his father when he was little and like all you can say in that situation is like okay go get help yeah instead of further like spreading the horribleness i was about to say what's that what's that uh phrase we use oh i mean me and tara use it for, oh what is that for the kids like not to um it's like the generational thing, not the generational Oh, generational curse. trauma? A curse and shit like that. Yeah. We don't Oh we don't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like don't don't spread that to your kids. Oh, I was Definitely. just thinking about that the other day. Like I was like, listen, I have spent a considerable amount of time and energy and money going through therapy so that I do not bring down the same trauma that I experienced when I was little yeah. before I was adopted. Like in this case alone. I couldn't go into much detail about the situation with the force feeding because that is something that happened to me when I was very little. And it is why I have such a weird, awful relationship with food even now. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me like before I was like six years old that my grandmother would try and force feed me food. It is trauma that still makes me like choke up every once in a while. Mm. So I'm like, Jesus, like... Before you procreate, make sure you have hand- put your ducks in a row. Yes. But I hope you can bring us into something a little lighter. Brittany, this, I'm going to tell you, this story broke my heart. Oh, great. So this is just a bad time. No, 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 no. Your story broke my heart. Oh, well, no, absolutely. It's, it's and like, I almost. Because I never watched the movies. I only ever read about what happened to Sylvia Likens. I didn't know it was as extensive as it was. I didn't know like when it started. Like rah. yeah, like I almost cried like twice. It was terrible. It was bad. And then I was writing this, <sighs> and then like you were like, "Oh, I can't. Oh, I can't do the podcast Saturday." I was like, "What about tomorrow?" You're like, "Oh, I can't do it yet. What about tomorrow?" I was putting it off because I didn't want to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you put it off to today. <sighs> We had to bump it like two times to recording. I was like, oh. It's okay. So I'm sorry for anybody who's listening who felt particularly traumatized. We did too. Yes, unfortunately. We do it for the content. Yeah. Here's your content. (laughs) Eddie needs you some content. (laughs) Here, enjoy. (laughs) But yeah, no, this is one of those situations just frustrating. Frustrating, frustrating, frustrating. It never got better. Okay, well, what you got for us? Let's lighten this mood because I'm this ready. is a fuck um, <laughs> ridiculous. Oh, huh, okay. I'm gonna start this off by reading a quote to you. Okay, and I'm gonna try to do it in my 
the oh, best voice and your your fancy voice actor and, voice and no and so i'm gonna mock somebody so oh, okay. i'm gonna i'm gonna try to do it in, in his voice as much as i can okay <clears throat> In 2014, I had a nightmare where I'm a spirit hanging out with other spirits, and I show them this trick I can do, moving an object on a table without touching it, like I, like what I tried to get spirits to do during my investigations. Then I'm suddenly in front of a door, and I can't control my body, and a door opens, and a 12-foot-tall goat figure is standing there in dark black smoke comes out of his mouth mm -hmm. and i'm forced to inhale it when i wake up my lungs hurt and i know that this was some serious shit that <laughs> meant something i'm sitting here trying to figure out what voice you were doing i'm trying to do zach baggins oh zach baggins <laughs> Oh my god you're right okay you're right he does do that like weird oh my did you do a week to make fun of one of my ghost people <clears throat> so that quote was from um zach's movie um demon house that i came watched out that i i tried to watch it as much as i could it has real mixed reviews on Reddit. <laughs> I know. People, some people are like very angry about it. I kind of was just like, no. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know why I still like Zach Bagans. I just do. Uh, I hate his voice so much. <laughs> and I was like, this is, like how he was saying it. And, like the, Listen, the last part. The Paveglia <laughs> Island episode from like way back, like 20 seasons ago, is one of my favorite episodes. Cause that was the that was the one with the the um what do you call it? Paveglia Island was where they had the the Black Death, the people who were the they put in Italy. Italy sent the people who were dying from the plague oh. there. Yeah, oh, that's right. Yes, that okay. was such a good episode. It was also a very long time ago. But regardless, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I, I hate how he he, he talks in his voice and it's like he talks like my kids are trying to imitate me. Like they're talking like ur, 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 ur. you know what I mean? Hi, also, I'm I Brian. I will say the series of videos that they released during quarantine are some of my favorite because they go through and they talk about previous cases and they watch it like mm -hmm. they watched it in like a movie theater by themselves and they talked about stuff and i thought like the behind the scenes nature of it is very interesting to me but there is stuff that ghost hunters do that show that i don't like yeah from a like tv show perspective yeah absolutely it's the same way that haunted on netflix like tries to make yes. it seem more scary than it is yes I and i'm just so like much. you could have just given me the good story you didn't need to like add the weird or like here's the thing that bothers me right i'm watching a show right and they're trying to do evps mm -hmm. And there's background music and there's background sounds. Like, I can't hear Fully sounds. I can't hear the EVP. Yeah. But anyway. <sighs> so. Talking about Demon House? So, yeah, let me get. Hold on. Oh, interesting. I'm so, so surprised. Yeah, as much as I I, I, I dislike uh, Zach Baggins and maybe the Ghost Adventure crew because of, you know, just, just it's bad TV. It's just fucking bad TV. And but maybe I, that's I, it. Maybe this is my version. Like, you know, like one of my coworkers watches The Bachelorette, yeah. like religiously, and she's like, it's just good trash TV. Maybe Ghost this Hunters is for me TV. is good. Para it's bad paranormal TV, and I love it. Oh my god! I'm gonna but, watch it till the day I die, like they, and then I'm gonna haunt it. <laughs> like they're, but you know, as much as I dislike them, they they're basically like everywhere I try. I like I want to look everywhere you want to go. They've yeah, been everywhere. Exactly. So you know, I give the I give it up to them for like their investigating. Side note: If you check the Discovery Plus app, because I should have sent you the password yeah, for you that. Did. There is a like three hour long like Penhurst Asylum uh, like not. documentary type thing. They stayed there for like well past like two weeks. Look, Brittany, his his movie was an hour and no, a no, half. No, it's not I... from him. It's another group. Okay. But another group of people <laughs> stay at Penhurst for like two weeks. It's not bad. I was about to say that movie is an hour and a half. The first time I tried to watch it, I only watched it 20 minutes and oh I was like, gosh. I'm done. And the, then... <laughs> the regular episodes are 45 minutes. It's only like a double. Look, and then I was like, okay, let me go. I gotta go back and try to finish watching it. So... I watched it for like another hour and I was like, okay, this, uh, okay. You've seen most of it. Yeah, I see most of it. Okay, but um, did you watch their Tiger King episode? Because that not. was comedy. Uh, no, I did not. And I was like, what does it got to do with paranormal stuff, guys? Um, Haunted tigers. <laughs> well, no. Um, they brought in cadaver dogs 
and got hits oh. for potential bodies that might have been discarded on the property. Like tigers? Well, no, people. Oh. That, I mean, Joe Exotic was doing some real Oh, yeah, shit. I know, I know. So, and they, apparently, like, people who worked there said that there was, like, an area on the outskirts where they would, like, throw all the dead, like, carcasses mm. for meat, everything. And at some point, they said somebody tried to, like, climb over a fence and they got got Ooh. and thrown in the pile. Got it. Oof. I guess I'll have to watch that sometime. Whatever. I'll do it whenever. Whenever I'm feeling bill- bored. And... <laughs> that's what happens to me. Like, honestly, lately I've been falling asleep to ghost shows. And I don't know if that's good for my general psyche. <laughs> but, like, I don't. It, it, Zach Bagan's voice does make me feel sleepy. Yeah, because it's boring as fuck. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on to my story today. <laughs> anyway, today I'll be going into yeah, the, the Ammon's uh, Haunting or the House of 200 Demons. Or, as a lot of people know it, um, Demon House. <clears throat> oh, I didn't know that was what it was called. Yeah, it's... Um, I feel bad because I definitely watched that whole little thing and I don't remember that at all being said. <laughs> also. So, I guess I have to give some credit to, you know, Zach for this since I did watch the movie and, like, you know, some... Oh, what's so- the worst? Some of our research is on all of that. Some of it, not all of it. Like a little, the last part, yes. That's all you're getting is that last little bit. And you got to wait to the end of my story to hear about it. All right, then I will wait till the end to learn. (laughs) So anyway, let's get to the story. So in November 2011, um, when Natoya Ammons and her family move into a house um, in Gary, Indiana, so it's um, her family is her mother uh, Rosa Campbell and her three children. Uh, their ages are seven, nine, and twelve. Uh, the twelve-year-old is her daughter. The two other children are her sons. Okay. Uh, as soon as they move in, or I guess not as soon as they move in, but uh, soon, some uh, big black flies start to swarm in her uh, closed off. You know, how they have that closed off patio. Uh, oh, right. The same thing that always happens in every. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Demon like, story, which is that flies suddenly appear in the dead of winter, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's in. It's, yeah, it's in December. Mm-hmm. It's December 2011. It was and, also in the Amityville house as well. That was a, a situation. Yeah. Um, Zach also mentioned that this, he thought this was going to be his next Am- or the next Amity. Ooh, I didn't see. Listen, it's been a while since I watched it. I watched it like as soon as it came out. I'm be really honest. I think I got Discovery Plus yeah. so I could watch it, I'm and not, I just have been paying for it because now it's got so much good content on Discovery Plus. I'm not doing any more quotes from it until the end of the day this, <laughs> until I'm done with this. But yeah, he did say that he thought it was going to be the next Amity, and it should have because well, because of the flies and stuff. Anyway, because it started with flies. Ooh. Um. <laughs> so yeah, it's December, and you know how you know everything dies that's one reason why i love fall and winter is because flies die all the bugs die they go or they hibernate whatever i don't care what happens to them they're not around me anymore that's true so that's true that's why i like to come out more in the fall and winter because i don't have to deal with bugs um but you know it's december how are these flies you know out on the porch like this either way the flies were killed But for some reason, the flies will always come back. Latoya's mom, Rosa uh, Campbell, is reported saying, we killed them and killed them and killed them, but they kept coming back. Um, I mean, I guess flies can come be around in the cold time, cold cold months. Um. In winter time, like inside your house, you keep it warm in there anyway. So I, I, I guess if like you're getting fruit from other places and the fruit dies because there's stuff on the yeah, skin and, yeah I, th- um, I think that i mean but these aren't fruit flies they're like they said they were like horse but flies. like i mean they can't survive freezing temps that's no, just no, the truth absolutely not and they don't hibernate either most of them don't no there are some hibernating fly species from other countries so next With some big old hornets oh my god not come back that would be great not the murder ones like the ones that attack the cicadas they scare the crap out of me i just hate Wait, you mean, you the mean cicada, cicada killers? killers? <laughs> yes, there's a bunch of them out front because it's cicada season. No, they don't, but they dive bomb the area and it scares the crap out of me when I'm waiting to go to work in the morning. 
So I end up walking out to like the street mm. <laughs> away from like where the nests are. They scare the crap out of me. I see. I see. They just did big stingy, stingy bits. They do have the big, it looks like a big stinger, but it's, I guess it's, it's just for the cicadas. It's the part where they attack the cicada and yeah. murder it. It's not for us. Like when I first saw them, when they first like started appearing, I was like, what the fuck is this? Because I don't really like playing around with stingy things. Well, my one friend works in landscaping and one day he like showed up to a property and they were all over the place. And he like called his boss and was like, "What are these bugs?" Mm-hmm. And like his boss was just like, "They're called cicada killers." He's like, "If you don't want to brave the landscape, you can just <laughs> file this as a in a inaccessible property." Oh my god! He was like, "They were scary," and I was like, "Right?" Yeah, they he are called me. He was like, "Have you ever heard of a cicada killer?" And I'm like, "I was just telling my campers about these fuckers the other day." Oh god. We were getting off the bus and they were all over these bushes near the bowling alley. It was weird. Yeah. Mm. But anyway. But anyway. Back to flies. <laughs> yes. We're all over the place tonight. I'm so sorry, people listening. So next in the story, Rosa starts to um see this shadowy figure just pacing out in the living room at night. Mm-hmm. Um so she goes to investigate, you know, see who the hell's in the house and as soon as she gets close, the, the shadowy figure like vanishes. <clears throat> but she uh, found wet boot prints where this figure was at. Oh, no. Yeah. She also claims to have been uh, choked by an unknown force. Unfun. In, in the house as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's not kinky at all. Um, uh, not the kind of fun that we want. So Latoya, <clears throat> Latoya and Rosa, they claim to hear footsteps from the basement steadily making their way up the stairs. Um, then the basement door opens and nobody would be there. Ooh, there we go. Nice spoop. Yeah. Okay. So one night, uh, it's... Uh, like some of some of the sources say it's um a sleepover. I think it's it's a sleepover because that's what I get from most sources. But some sources add some more stuff to it. So, um, one night, one of, um uh, Latoya's twelve year old daughter, she's having a sleepover in her grandmother's room with uh, one of her friends. Now there are relatives over at the house. Um, they're mourning a the death of somebody in the family. Um, when Latoya sees her daughter asleep floating above the bed. She yells to Rosa. Well and, then. Yeah, well then. She yells to Rosa to come into the room and check it out. Um so her, Rosa, other, you know, family members, they go into the room and okay. they basically like surround the bed and then they start praying around it. Oh God. And then like they're just praying for a while, and eventually she stops floating. I'm not sure if it was That's because pretty good. Yeah, you I'm know? not sure if it was because of the uh, the praying, but probably not. It was, you know, she just stops floating. <laughs> um, she wakes up, and she has no memory of this happening at all. Yeah, it's about right. Um, the relatives that were there left and refused to come back ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, totally understandable, but still funny. Yeah. Um, They're like, oh, we're going to have a potluck. Do you want to come? <laughs> Listen, last time one of your kids was like two feet above the bed. It, I'm going to have to pass. It's like when your family knows that you got roaches. It's like, oh, you got those, ro- you got those roaches. No, you got those ghosts up in there. Mm, no, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't know ghosts following me back home. <laughs> got them, got them ghosts. Listen, fam. Oh, my God. It's going to be me and the ghost chilling. <laughs> During this time, take a selfie. There's like a random hand behind you. <laughs> but these are demons, no. not ghosts, right? I don't want it to demons. Yeah, I'm yeah. cool with ghosts, but not demons. And really, I'm not cool with ghosts, if we're honest. This is true. I just want to hang out and watch them. Um, so during this time, the kids are uh, missing school uh, irregularly, mm-hmm. um, behaving weird. Um, there are, of course, problems that raise concern. Um, Latoya had her physician come out. His name was oh, I did not look up his last name. I'm going to say his first name. His name was Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeffrey Bezos. No, Jeffrey One. 
Oh, okay. O- on, on, yeah, something. How do you spell it? O N Y E U K W U. Ooh, no, thank you. See, exactly. So anyway, um, and he witnesses the kids acting like they're delusional. Oh. Um. So the kids are taken to a hospital, and an IRO boy. Uh, he seems like he's fine, but the youngest, the seven-year-old one, he's about, he's like thrashing around and like fighting everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know when this happens, that this next part I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to say when they're back home, but I'm going to just add it in here right now. At some point, the nine-year-old goes flying across the room. Oh, no. No explanation at all. Nobody knows what happened. He just was drawn by an invisible force. Okay. Wowza. Um, but yeah. So, at home. Well, I guess not at home. Um, so, <sighs> they're at the hospital, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, DCS um, and, or, or CPS, whatever you want to call it. The different names, different states. It's all the same. I think, I think they call Child it, welfare. Yeah. Um, you know, they come to check on the kids at the hospital. I think I remember this part of the movie. Okay. Um, so the case manager, Valerie Washington, um, has the privilege of doing an initial investigation. Um, while she was interviewing this seven-year-old, he starts growling. Um, was growling at her. So now I got this from Wikipedia. Now Wikipedia says that this happens with, uh, I, I thought it said with the nine-year-old, but I think the nine-year-old does the... I don't know. Either way, they they need a little mix up a little bit. Okay. So be careful with your sources, kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the younger boy he he grabs. So there, she's in the room interviewing the seven year old, but uh, he's in the room with his nine year old brother. Okay. Um. So the younger boy grabs his brother's throat and start you know starts choking him. Um. It takes a couple of adults to pry his hands off of him. Mm-mm. Um. Later on, Valerie and an RN, they, uh, you know, they talk to the boys in a sep- another separate exam room, and this is when it starts getting weird. So again, the seven-year-old is growling at his brother. Then he starts say- saying things. He says, "Um, it's time to die," and um. But you know what? Kids do be saying weird stuff like that. I know. It, it, he, they, they do. My kids do. They but, just <laughs> kids are weird. Well, he says it in like a deep voice. He's like, "It's time to die, and I will kill you." Okay, things like that. Um, now at this time, oh right, uh, Rosa is also in this exam room with them. So that's their grandma, um, <clears throat> and she's like holding the nine-year-old's hands. <clears throat> And he's like kind of headbutting her in the stomach for some reason. I'm not sure why, but you know he starts acting even more weird. So he begins to smile very, very creepily. And as he's still holding hands with Rosa, mm-hmm. he starts walking backwards towards the wall. I do remember this now. <laughs> and like he doesn't stop at the wall. He starts to climb up the wall backwards. Yep. Like Spider Man style. Yep. Um still holding hands with Rosa. Yep. I remember this. Okay. <laughs> um, he then flips from the wall over Valerie and like I said, this whole time he's still holding Rosa's hands. <laughs> and like it's just creepy. Like how how are you doing this? We were just walking up to like I yeah, I, I saw this and I was like, mm, that seems weird. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. So there's this picture. I don't know if you've seen this picture. There's this picture of the house. Um, it's of the exterior of the house, of course. Mm-hmm. And in it, you can see like a whitish shadow. And I don't know what you would call that. It's a white shadow. Okay. I just I love saying it because I love watch Turbo, and it's like white shadow. Okay. Anyway, there's this whitish shadow in one of the windows. No one was home at the time. Right. Um, so it was published by the Indie Star. Okay. Um, 
with the caption saying it was taken by the ham him on the police um but the hammond police chief said that it wasn't an official police photo and it wasn't taken by any police authorities so okay that's know, weird i don't know where they got this picture from somebody yeah probably photoshopped it and whatever you never know it could have just been something somebody did yeah true 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 okay so DCS swoops in and they take emergency custody of the kids. Uh, Valerie Washington reported that the children were experiencing spiritual and emotional distress. Uh, now, this was all, you know, temporary um, placement, of course. Um, so DCS, they said that Latoya neglected the kids. Right. Ed- like by she, ne- she neglected their education by not having them in school regularly. Um, apparently this was also, uh, an issue back in 2009 when she did the same thing with them. Um, so yeah, this was like three years before they moved into this house. So I don't know what the issue was back then. Um, Latoya said that the spirits would make the kids sick or that they would, you know, keep them up all night long. Right. So okay. So that's why they didn't go to school. Um, the kids were evaluated by a psych by some psychologists, and they came to the conclusion that the kids were probably just playing around with their mother's theory or, or you know, how her stories and, you know, just trying to appease her. No, no, I understand what they're saying. Yeah. Um, so Latoya, she's at her, like her wits end right now. The kids are gone. Demons in the house. People think she's crazy. Like, it's rough. <laughs> so she comes... So in comes um, Reverend Michael. Oh, I did not get your last name looked up either. It's I'm gonna say Magnet, Mag Magnot. Um, <laughs> who interviews the family? Um, well, the toy and her mom, and he believes them. Like he notices that you know the house is weird, the energy's off, the vibes not. You know, but he did a vibe check and it was not right um <laughs> he determined that they were being tormented by demons as well as latoya was being like po- she was probably possessed by a demon um and he told latoya and rosa to not stay in the house so they go live with some relatives for a while so i'm just going to fast forward this because i'm just going to get to the meat <laughs> this was the end part i guess um so, Rebel Michael, he comes in, he exercises the house and Latoya. Right. And it's a success. So, Latoya is then reunited with her children. And after everything happens, um, they move to Indianapolis. So, <laughs> that's basically the story of that. So, let's go into... Some of the skeptics oh, of this story. Oh, I don't like the skeptics. I know, I know. <laughs> but I gotta, because they're good skeptics. Okay, like I said, she had her physician, uh, Jeffrey, come in, right? And he was just, he said he was just skeptical the entire incident. Um, Like, he didn't, like, when he came to, you know, evaluate the kids and stuff like that, he said he didn't notice anything paranormal. He just said that... Um. They had delusions of ghosts in their house and or hallucinations. Um, And like I said, the children had a history of irregular attendance. So that was like a a claim that was placed back in 2009. Um, But yeah, she she claimed that, no, it was the ghosts that were keeping them up. Um, Let's see what else. Right. Okay. So <laughs> this is funny. Charles Reed, he is a landlord that, you know, rented his house out to her. He said that he never experienced any supernatural events at the house. Right. I do remember that. The new owner doesn't feel anything, right? Huh, that's funny. I'll get to that later. Um, also, like his prior tenants to her moving in there, they never experienced anything either. He said that uh, Latoya was behind on lease, though, and used the the paranormal claims to avoid making payments to her, making rent payments. 
I don't know, because I remember seeing the lady and she was like, she was so afraid of anything to do with the house. that This is true. She would not. The fact that he had been in it at all. She was like, you're not allowed in here. Yeah. She's like, you can't even come be near me. You were in. She's like, have you already been in the house? Yes. You can't come here. Because didn't um, Zach bought it eventually, right? Yes. This is where okay, we're getting. Yeah. This is actually what we're going to next. So, yeah. In 2014, Mr. Zachary Baggins. 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 I'm sorry. He says that at the beginning of every episode. I'm sorry. I, I'm Zach Bagans. I'm Zach Bagans. <laughs> I have a reason. But yeah, no, I remember it was all over the news. And then he said a lot of like weird stuff happened. Yeah. And it kept stopping him from doing the investigation so, he wanted. Yeah, it I guess it took him about three years to actually film this this movie. He said that like there was legal stuff, there was like people quitting on him. Well, that, uh, pe- I'm sure that always happens at that job. Yeah, I mean, people quitting, people getting sick because of the the location. What, yeah, um, but yeah, uh, so he bought the house in 2014, um, and so this, you know, this is public. Everybody knows about this stuff. Mm-hmm. He, you know, so one of his um, medium friends gets in touch with him. Right. Um, did you see this part? Is you it the lady part? that's? Is it the the one of the friends that died? No, it's a guy. Okay, because there was I've, another person that died. I think while he was making it. It's uh, Chris Fleming. Okay. Um. So you see, text Zach, and I'm going to read you this text message. Okay. Okay. So it says, "Hey, bro. Hope you're all right and not possessed already. Just got off the phone with Adam Bali. Um. Be safe. Saw visions of this demon." Being very, very large, almost like a hulking type figure. Horns turn turn back and centurion feet. Be careful. Adam thinks it's an eight out of a ten on a demonic scale below Satan himself when it comes to possession, like one of one of the generals. Well, I think the thing that was interesting to me was they never really spent like a whole lot of time there. No, not really. They, that uh, that was surprising to me. It wasn't a very big property. No, um, no. But really. I was actually most interested by the interviews with the like social workers and attorneys and people and yeah. other folks that were there. Yeah, like her family who were also frightened. Yeah, her family like that the came one in. woman who, like, she went there. Like, she was there for the crawling up the wall situation. Yeah, the Valerie. That's and then Valerie. she quit and moved to another state. Yep. And was like, I'm good. I'm done with working with <laughs> that was definitely Valerie. children forever. Like the, for me, I feel like that is the kind of thing that legitimizes stuff because that's somebody who's seen like probably some of the worst situations exactly. you can ever imagine. Yeah. Like something that would make someone who's an in an on site in house social worker quit their job and never come back to it. They saw something terrible. Yeah. But um. Yeah, like I um, so yeah, Zach, you know, this is his house, you know, he filmed his movie there, mm-hmm. then demolished the building. Right. Uh, in 2016. So, I'm, I'm believing that, this because. I believe what they were saying was that it was becoming, because he wasn't actively living in it. Yeah. It was becoming a site for people to show up and try and scare themselves. People right. were breaking in. I know there were squatters there. He was there. getting calls from the cops consistently. Yeah. So it was just easier to demolish the property. Yeah. And now it's just empty. And like, you know, what you going to do? Pitch a tent on the property? You'd be all right. <laughs> Oh my god. And um so you saw the movie, right? Oh uh, yeah. So uh, there were like I think a couple times he did get like he he well he felt bothered. Pos- he he felt possessed. He 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 had lost track of time. Like um on one of the security videos, he was Having an argument with one of the guys. Oh, one of the camera guys freaked out. Yeah. And like lost it. And then the camera guy said that he saw something 
in the base in the hallway it was somewhere when they were yeah. back at the hotel yeah like because uh, i believe it was aaron yes. or one of the other people yes. who does the tours like the actual ghost things with him yes and aaron like pulled his camera and you just see the guy like pacing in the hallway having a total and complete meltdown they were in like a whole they were in a hotel they were in a hotel nearby and he was he just ran out of his room he started he was loud and cussing he just yeah. ran into somebody and then he said he went to get in the elevator and he opened the door and he yeah. saw it yeah, and he was cussing at it, and, and he it just... was like to the top of the, the yeah. room. Yeah, he's like, "What's going on?" The ele-? like Zach was like, "What's going on with the elevator, bro?" He's like, "What's going on?" He's like, "Nothing. Whatever's in the whatever. If anything's in here, it's a bitch." Like that's what he was saying. He's like, "You're because <laughs> he was calling the thing a bitch the whole time." And... Well, he was scared too. Yeah, it was I just know. Like, and it's just I, I was just. Okay, well, maybe you saw something. Okay. But, he saw something. But no, Zach himself was, like, possessed. Zach has, has had those experiences before on yeah. the show. And um, there's always lots of, you know, discussions about it. Um, it's it's obviously not a traditional possession yeah. in what we think of. Because there's there's different stages to possession. This is true. Um. And we've talked about those in past podcasts. Yeah, in, in the me. Warren's episode. Or two Warren episodes. Or, back to back. This is true. Um, but yeah, there's lots of... Because um, you have the... What do you call that? The It's not obsession. It's the oppression. It's oppression, infestation. I, mean, I, I feel like... I think infestation is beginning the first one. I feel like those moments that Zach has are more oppression based. Mm. It's him aware that there is something there trying to bother him. Yeah. I don't I don't think he's really fully, you know, possessed because that's something that doesn't happen like that. Yeah, no. It takes a while. Well the process, the the oppression process is breaking the person down. Mm-hmm. You have trouble sleeping. You you can't eat. You become physically weak. And then once you're physically incapable of fighting back the thing trying to gain access to you. And that's when your possession yep. takes over. So. But yeah, that was my story of the demon house. More demons. Look at you. I, I like, I don't know. Demons are interesting. See, that's say. what's so interesting to me. I am thoroughly, that's a real fear for me. Demons? Yeah. Being possessed? Just um, waking up in the middle of the night, seeing one shadow demon in your corner, just Spider-Man and off the wall. Well, no, I had a situation in college where I definitely felt the whole concept of oppression. I started having these nightmares and everybody in the nightmares were like, they were all people I love and they all somehow ended up dying in front of me every time. And they happened consistently and constantly for weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm. So I'm trying to go to school yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. in the dorm in my dorm room by myself. Um, I'm, and this is one of those things where I'll never know. Was I hallucinating from lack of sleep? You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I was sitting in my my room by myself. Um, I remember there was a situation with the TV turning on like more than once oh. and me actively turning it off. I remember looking at the wall and my roommate had this stupid fucking picture of these like two guys carrying each other. And one of the middle was like drunk. And they oh. were carrying the one that said teamwork. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at the picture and it looked like the picture changed. Oh. And then I remember having a solid sense that there was something in the room with me. And it was just out of range of me being able to see it. Like breathing, I could hear it. That's not good. And I legitimately like covered myself in a pillow and i was like oh my god my bible is under my bed and i can't go look for it Mm -hmm. because you know you have those like tall college beds right and i called one of my friends the only i was like i called other people and people didn't pick up and i called my one friend possibly the most religious person i know and i like i was freaking out and i was just like i just need you to like talk me through i don't know what to say i don't know what to read i don't know what to do in this situation um and then the next day Wildly enough, she had like a whole container of holy oil and she like showed up the next day and she was just like, oh, yeah, whenever I move somewhere new, my mom, like she's like, my pastor told me how to like bless places before I move in. Yeah. And it's honestly something that I do now, too. 
You know, like when that, I move into a new location, I, I believe in smudging things and I believe in also blessing properties. That's very funny. You know why? Because in this story, um, so Latoya was told the same thing to, um, you know, get olive oil and water, bless it and, you know, bless the house and stuff. Bless her children, like put it on the children's foreheads. Like, oh, right, right. But that's after it's already there. <laughs> yeah. So. Like before I move into a location, like, but when I, like from that point on, when I move to a new apartment or a new dorm, yeah, I, I do certain things before I move in. But the funny part is like, she did this, she's splashing, you know, the oil and stuff everywhere. Then they claim to find like this substance, like on the blinds and stuff yeah. that was like oily and slick and sticky. And like, wasn't that just the stuff you, you splashed everywhere? But they said that they like tried to get it tested and they couldn't figure out what it was. Mm. I didn't see that part. I mean, if it is the same thing, that means she was going pretty ham. Yeah. Just like. Because it was on the blinds. You're not supposed to like coat every surface. It was dripping down the blinds. (laughs) I saw that. Yeah. Because didn't he also see that same substance when he was there during the recording? Yeah. So that wouldn't have been left over. I hope not. From years later i hope not but yeah i don't know i just remember when he tried to talk to the one the, the one woman and then i remember that didn't he have the one like lady's kids there and the yeah. one girl tried to yeah, take yeah, her yeah. own life after she was in the yes. house yes oh my god so much stuff happened because i forget who it was but she as soon like before they even it got the into the one, house like niece or nephew who got brought back and that yeah. girl that girl tried to hurt herself after they left yeah she did so. Like, yeah, before they even got into the house, like, she felt something, like, kick her or something like that. And... I mean, the other factor, too, here is... I hate to say this, but, like, entities or things of that nature, like... <sighs> these are intelligent beings, according to the rules and the lore. True. Wouldn't you focus on who you thought was weaker if your goal was to take them over? Normally, yes. That's what you're supposed to do. Right. So, like, maybe it wouldn't be the kind of thing where everybody who comes into contact with that house is bothered by it. Hmm. Maybe for some reason, maybe because of the previous abuses and things like that that happened within that family, they were already in a weakened state. That might be, you know, and well, like, why would you go for the harder person to convert? Yeah, that's a movie thing where they're like, aha, I'm a demon. I'm going to try and get the priest. Yeah. No, you're not. You want you the, get one the easiest who's, one. Yeah, yeah. You want the kid who's got the Ouija board playing by themselves oh in the God. middle of the night. One that's the kid that. you take out. Yes. Get you a Damien. <laughs> Oh, goodness. But anyway, that was our, our, our longer podcast than usual. Yeah, I, I kind of figured it would be longer. I'm if you listened, <clears throat> thank you. If you listened all the way to the end, thank you so much. Yes, we um, do appreciate it. We love you guys. And one thing that I forgot to also mention was that uh, as far as the Patreon goes, if you subscribe in the first month, I am going to... I might, I might keep this up indefinitely for patrons, but... I will put either your name or your social media handle in a video and it will live on Mm. my TikTok, which currently has 760,000 people. We are chugging along to a million. We're probably going to get there by December. Goodness, by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, by the end of the year. So you will get to see, you know, you'll get to have your name as someone who supported us forever. Yeah, and we might put you also in like the title card for the YouTube if we ever eventually catch up with putting our videos. Whenever I see you, you post like two at a time, and I'm like, oh, look at that. I'm trying. I understand. Listen, you're doing what I don't want to do, so I totally appreciate you. Whenever I'm bored, I'm like, oh, you know what I could do right now? A little more videos for YouTube. I appreciate you, Brian. I was like, oh, look at that. There's a Ryan Faye Copeland that just went up. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. You can always find uh, me every day or every other day on Cop Podcast at TikTok.com. Yeah, TikTok.com. I guess TikTok. It is a dot .com, but yeah. mainly it's the website. It's Cop Podcast. Uh, you can always view our website, which is www.whenkillersgetcaught.com. And that has links to every social media that we are on. Mm-hmm. I have been trying to post more on uh, TikTok, Facebook. I'm trying to spread out. Um 
you know, post popular videos that are popular on TikTok on other platforms. I am contemplating potentially making more exclusive content that is only eligible for patrons only. Right. Yes. Um, so that there'll be TikTok style videos, but they will only be on Patreon. Uh, and let's see uh, that way, like stuff that TikTok has been like taking down. Mm hmm. Uh, I can post on there and not have to worry about it being censored. Well, I do have like the stories thing on Patreon mm -hmm. too. So yeah, yeah, that'll work. yeah. Um, Brian is going to be trying to move, I believe, next month Twitch to Fridays, several times a month. No, Fridays um, and Sundays. I'm trying to oh, do, like, like, ooh, I'm trying to do more than. Hey, anything. I love it. I'm trying, I'm trying. Get more active. Yes. So we would love your support there, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you left a really nice review, we like you love so much. Uh, someone recently got mad that we didn't like the Yorkshire Ripper documentary, and I'm not sorry. Oh well, I'm not, not sorry. Not every documentary is for every person. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was boring like personally, to me. I like, can't yeah. watch the Chris Watts one, not because it's bad quality, but because it's so good, it's unsettling and upsetting. Yeah, I watched it and I was like, oh my god, all the footage of the family just is so like gut wrenching. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some stuff doesn't sit well with certain people, but we're happy you're here and we thank you for your support. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night.